Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, am I the jerk for making a 21-year-old woman shower for the first time in at least four days? I, 23 female, and my best friend Holly, who's 21, are completely sympathetic to the fact that having a shower may be a sensory issue for some people, and Chloe, 21 female, all fake names, claims that this includes her. With this being said, she knew she was going away for a week. We had six months notice on a marine biology field course, sharing a room with two other people. We were all friends before this trip. When Chloe is at home, she has a bath once every 10 days and is bathed by her boyfriend. We received absolutely no warning of this, nor did we receive a warning that she would not be planning to shower or brush her teeth for the duration of the trip. Ugh. Marine biology is quite labor intensive and of course involves standing on the beach and literally in the ocean. This trip also includes mile-long walks every day to get to these beaches. Had Chloe at least used baby wipes every morning, then the smell wouldn't have gotten to the point that it did. But oh my goodness, you guys, the smell. It was straight up onions, vinegar, and B.O. I threw up twice because of it. Actually, the worst smell from something living that I've ever smelt. At this point, four days of walking and climbing rock pools, we could no longer deal with the smell at all. Even our other friends that would walk past the room would gag. I really am not being dramatic. Instead of using antiperspirant or deodorant, she was using impulse body spray, a perfume, under her arms and on her feet, making the smell a million times worse. To top off all of this, there was an outbreak of bacterial meningitis in our class whilst we were away. It was only at this point that we asked her to shower. We only asked her to shower to reduce the risk of infection, and we also mentioned the smell at this point. We all weren't sure about the ins and outs of this illness and how it spread, and we wanted to be as clean as possible after seeing our classmates and being within close confines of them all day. We all remember what lockdown was like, and we were treating it like that. We did ask nicely. We said the room smelled and that we all had to take a shower. We didn't know it was a sensory issue at this point. Then it would improve the smell and the situation for all of us. Holly showered, I thought, then Chloe left the room to go see some of her friends. We were absolutely baffled. The next day, we asked less nicely. It was ripe. She walks out of the room and returns five minutes later with one of our uni lecturers. She had spoken to the uni lecturer and accused us of bullying her. She's also made an anonymous submission to our university's drama Facebook page, which says the following. Edit. I had to remove her post, as apparently some dude named Tyler took it upon himself to find out which uni I attended. Creepy. So, here's my rewording of it. I've changed none of the context, just the words that were said, so they can't be found by people like Tyler. If you want to go on this trip, don't. I was bullied so much, I cried every night, and the staff did nothing. I know the two girls who did it will see this post, and here's my message to both of you. My family and I aren't happy, and we will be taking this matter to the police for bullying and to the university for non-academic misconduct. We are at university now. You would think people would have matured, but apparently not. Bullying is serious. Now this came as a complete shock. She had not been crying every night, or at least not that we noticed, nor did we give her a reason to cry every night. The only thing we can possibly think of, and we've checked with our other friends, was the mention of the smell and the fact that she needs to take a shower. It hurts us that this has upset her so much, but our point is, if you know you're going away for a week and you do not plan on showering or know you have difficulty doing this, wouldn't you warn your roommates, plan to use baby wipes? She admitted that she's fine doing that. If we had known about the awful personal hygiene this 21-year-old has, then there's no way we would have agreed to share a room with her. So, am I the jerk? Edit. I'd like to make it very clear we did not avoid her. She came to the pub with us by invitation and sat at our table, along with other things we invited her to. Nor did me and Holly choke at the smell. This was done by people who were not sharing a room with us. We still wanted to be her friend. The people choking from the smell weren't really friends with her in the first place. We made the attempt to tell her delicately, which was us saying the room stank and that we could all have a shower to mitigate the issue. Other than that, we had no idea what to do. Also, don't worry, Holly and I are home safe in our nice smelling rooms. The first thing we did when we got home was take a shower. Update. Chloe has seen this. Updates to follow when I wake up and deal with this crap show. Update. Holly's final statement. I'm too old for this crap. I'm not disrespecting the fact she may or may not have sensory issues, 
I just wish it was mentioned before we shared a room with her, which is the least of what should have happened. I just want a quiet life. Message from Chloe last night. If you're going to make a Reddit post about me, at least tell the truth rather than lying. This is going to be taken further now because it's bang out of order. My response. Please, could you highlight any lies from my throwaway Reddit account with change names? And Holly and I will review them in the morning. I'm entitled to ask the internet if I'm being a jerk, which they decided I was not. We tried, Chloe, and we asked Reddit to try and see other perspectives. She has read it, but not responded. Edit, she blocked me. Still no response. What I'd really like is some advice on what to do next. This girl is threatening my academic career, and it's not fair. My class finishes at 3 p.m. We will be speaking to a lecturer. Edit. As someone who was bullied for many years, I know what it's like for people to look at you like you're weird. Chloe owns and brings in reborn dolls to uni, and for the first year, Holly and I were the only two people to defend her. Everyone else looked at the girl like she was crazy. This is why we felt like we should stay in a room with her, and we hoped it would bring us all closer. Boy, was I wrong. I'm sorry I'm too nice, I guess. I'm trying to work on it. I get told a lot that I don't have a backbone. Update. We spoke to the lecturer who organized the trip. She has heard nothing from Chloe at all and agrees that everything was blown way out of proportion and that Chloe has no legal ground to stand on. It seems those empty threats were just that, empty. The lecturer told us that Chloe was originally offered a room on her own and she didn't take it. That is an understatement. She's aware of my Reddit post as well as Chloe's Facebook post. The lead lecturer will be speaking to the lecturer who made Chloe shower. She's going to the police because your group asked her to take a shower? Boy, oh boy, I wish I could be a fly on the wall when that complaint happens. She's going to get laughed out of the police station. Not the jerk. Her mental health triggers are her responsibility, and if she's going to be sharing space with others, it's common sense to not smell disgusting. Not the jerk. Does she really have issues, or just likes her boyfriend to bathe her? She will suffer harsh insults going forward due to her atrocious stench. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Chloe? Please let us know. Bruh, if you can't handle your friends telling you that you stink and need to take a shower, good luck surviving in the real world. Am I the jerk for saying, I didn't know you weren't the father of your wife's kid to my brother's friend? So I, 32 female, went to pick up my brother, who's 29, and his buddies, who are 26 and 31, from their game night. Something I regularly do since my brother often volunteers to be my designated driver if I go out to the bars. But as they're getting in my car, his one buddy Jay starts talking about how he can't go to the Friday game because he has to babysit so his wife can go to a movie or something, really sarcastically. Well, I looked over at my brother who's riding shotgun who has an eye twitch going on. So I know he's probably been complaining about this most of the night, but I let it go, figuring that he's venting and maybe being a jerk, but whatever. He's got a five-month-old at home, and I know it can be frustrating, and sometimes you need to talk it out with your buddies. Well, it keeps up. I swear it was just non-stop him talking. Ten minutes into the drive, he's mentioned babysitting probably 15 to 20 times. So as we pull up to a red light, I calmly look back at him and go, I didn't know that you weren't the father of your wife's baby. He starts freaking out, asking what I meant. How could I say that? And I guess I was a spark in a keg, because my brother snaps. Well, a father doesn't babysit their kid. You're their parent, so you parent them, you idiot. And your wife is allowed a night out if you're spending four hours out with us playing 40k. Now my brother is a big guy, but a gentle giant, so I don't think Jay or E were expecting that. Well, the whole car went silent, them out of shock. My brother fuming, but I was silently laughing, since he said exactly what I meant, and I'm used to my brother's more wild temper having lived with him. But we dropped Jay off first and he took off like a scared dog with his tail tucked between his legs and E was like, that wasn't cool. But I couldn't figure out if he was talking about what I said or if he was talking about my brother's blow up. Well, apparently C called E earlier this morning because Jay was sulking around the apartment all night after getting home and is currently being pouty and keeps commenting about how he's a good father and partner. So E called me to say that we were way too hard on him and how it's stressful being a new dad. I don't really think we're jerks here, because he was sounding like a jerk, but maybe I'm just biased because hearing men say that they're babysitting their own kids is a huge pet peeve both my brother and I learned from our dad, but maybe I'm wrong and we should apologize. Not the jerk. Jay needed to hear that, not from his wife, who he already resents, but from his buddies who he respects. You were right, a dad doesn't babysit, he parents. 
Men need other men to call them out when they're being jerks to their family. He's being pouty and sulking because the comment hits home and sometimes it sucks to look in the mirror and see how crappy you've been. I sincerely hope he takes your brother's rant to heart and adjusts his attitude. His wife deserves a partner, not a babysitter. Thanks OP for being one of the good ones. Your parents raised you and your brother right. Not the jerk. Was the delivery harsh? Yes, but it seems that it was needed. If your brother wants to, he can apologize for the manner of telling the truth. And yes, fatherhood is stressful. So is motherhood with the added physical recovery. Keep calling out the idiots. Maybe find a gentler way. Am I the jerk for asking my wife to let me have a turn to talk? I'm 34 male and my wife Polly is 32. Like a lot of couples, we debrief after our work days. Polly works in a high touch, high interaction job so we usually say our hellos, make dinner, and then eat separately so she can wind down a bit. Then afterwards, we sit in the living room and we talk about stuff. Polly has a mild neurodivergence, which means she tells, let's call it branching, stories. She will get bogged down in side stories and background stories that details that, frankly, add nothing to the core story about our workday. That's usually fine, but I've noticed it's getting a bit worse, to the point that by the time she's done, it's basically time to watch a show and go to bed. I mean, I'm spending upwards of an hour just listening and adding, mm-hmm, and oh wow, because she says she gets even more distracted when I ask questions. I brought this up with Polly, but she said that I'm asking her to mask her disorder, and that's just how her brain works. I get that feeling, I really do, but I'm starting to feel like I'm a side character here because she takes up all of the airtime that we set aside to debrief. Here's why I might be the jerk. I said... We all change our communication styles based on context, right? And she said that's different and that masking is not code switching. I just want some time to talk about my day too, but I don't want her to feel bad. Am I the jerk? Polly is 32 years old and she's completely monopolizing your time together. OP. To be fair to my wife, she really does try. She puts work into asking me how my day was, then asks follow-up questions. No jerks here. Sounds like you need to switch things up. You should talk first so you get a chance to talk about your day, then she can use the rest of the time. I know how your wife feels. For me, branching out like that is the only way I can really vent. OP. Okay, help me understand. Sometimes she brings up things that are genuinely unimportant, like objectively, the color of her boss's shoes doesn't really matter to the story about her big boss meeting. How does it work inside your brain when you're bringing that up? Think of it this way. A neurotypical brain connects point A to point B to point C. For example, I didn't sleep well last night, which meant I got up late, so I was late for work. A neurodivergent brain is more like a spider web. Point A connects to B1, B2, B3, etc. B1 connects to C1, C2, C3, etc. And all those points are interconnected. So for example, I slept badly last night, so I woke up late, I watched a movie where that happened to a guy, and as a result, he got caught up in an espionage case. At one point, he stepped in blood and his white shoes turned red. My boss had red shoes on yesterday. Oh, I need new shoes. My old ones are falling apart. I wonder if that chicken place is still in the mall, and so on. Update. Okay, so it turns out that I was a little bit of a jerk. Like nothing wild, but we had a good talk. Here's what she said to me. Being a teacher is hard. Being a teacher with untreated ADHD is even harder. She said she spends all day trying to contain her brain from doing what it naturally does, which is veer off in random directions that may or may not be relevant to a given conversation. So she does that all day, and she literally looks forward to coming home so she doesn't have to do that. Me bringing it up in the context of how we interact at night hurt her feelings because us interacting time is her space where she can just let her brain be her brain. Is masking the right term there? I don't know. She apologized for using it because she saw it on social media and thought it fit, but it might not. She felt bad for dominating the conversation though because she's not a monster and she says that she lashed out because she felt bad but also didn't want to lose access to the time of the day in which she's not fighting with her own brain. We decided to use advice I received here in Am I the Jerk? I'll go first when we talk at the end of the night. If I regularly go over time, then we'll start using a phone timer to make sure everyone has time to talk and she'll try to work more interaction into her stories so my role isn't just saying, mm-hmm, yeah, over and over. Thanks for the advice. We're using it and we're confident it'll work. Mean note left in the cookie dough was never read. I come out looking like a champ. This story just happened a little while ago. 
I've been craving chocolate chip cookies and was on my way home from errands earlier this afternoon intending on making some. I could make them completely from scratch. I'm a good cook and a baker, but I usually buy the fridge rolls and an extra bag of chips and bake them, and they taste just as good in my opinion. No one ever complains when I hand them warm out of the oven chocolate chip cookies. I had planned on stopping on the way home and picking the supplies up. When I remembered that I had some frozen cookie dough in the deep freezer, I discovered it a few nights ago while looking for something else in the freezer because the tub was at the very bottom. Yes, my freezer needs cleaning out. I bought the tub of cookie dough a year ago, last spring during a high school fundraiser. My friend Sarah, mid-30s, has an older sister, Julie, late 30s, with kids in high school. The proceeds from the fundraiser were to pay for a chorus trip that Julie's daughter went on over the last summer, so despite me thinking that the cookie dough was far overpriced, I bought a bucket. Hey, I was a band kid. I remember those days. A couple of weeks later, I was at Sarah's house and Julie was there as well. I was in the process of selling one of my old vehicles and Julie's car had just stopped working and she asked me how much I wanted for mine. I told her the price and she smiled a little and said, what's the sister of your friend price? I laughed thinking it was a joke and told her it was the same price, that I needed to get that much out of the car and it was well worth the price I was asking. Julie then offered me half of what I was asking in cash. I said no. She added another $100 and again I said no. Julie was no longer smiling and told me I was being greedy and everyone who sells cars bargains and I should have started out higher if I want to get what I was asking. I don't bargain. When I sell something, I sell it for the price I need to get. Eventually, Julie got upset when she saw I wasn't going to come off of my price and called me greedy again, told Sarah she had some crappy friends in front of me and left. I didn't hear from her or see her again for a few months. Sarah just rolled her eyes and told me to ignore Julie because she could be a real drama queen when she didn't get her way. The cookie dough orders arrived and I picked my bucket up from Sarah. As these things tend to go, I didn't want to make cookies at that moment, so I put the bucket in the deep freeze and promptly forgot about it. It eventually sunk to the bottom of the deep freeze as things got added, subtracted, and moved around. In the year and a half since then, I've been around Julie several times while hanging out with Sarah. At first, she was very cool to me, but eventually she warmed back up, and while we are friendly, I wouldn't call us friends. I do, however, remember Sarah telling me about six or eight months ago that she was so proud and impressed with me that I could be the better person. I wasn't sure what she was talking about at that time, so I just said thanks. I got home about an hour ago and dug the bucket out of the freezer. Think a one-gallon plastic ice cream bucket, but full of cookie dough. I pulled the top off, and inside the bucket, sitting on top, was the following note on a post-it. I hope you choke on this, jerk. I just sat and roared with laughter. This woman thought she was getting back at me and kept waiting for me to react for over a year and a half, all the while that little sticky note was sitting in that bucket in the bottom of my freezer. Meanwhile, my friend thinks I'm noble, so I'm thinking Julie confessed that she left the note at some point. No one has ever brought it up to me, and I don't plan on mentioning it again. Should someone mention it to me, I'll look them dead in the eye and say, the cookies were the best I've ever had and then I'm going to grin. Sometimes revenge is best served cold, and sometimes it's piping hot and melty delicious, as is this cookie I'm chewing on while typing this. I added walnuts and pecans to the dough as well as extra chips. In the end, I got the last laugh, and yeah, a day after she tried to cut me on the cost of my vehicle, a guy paid full price and said the tires alone were worth what I was asking. I, female 27, recently found my partner's, male 28, secret life. We've been together for almost 10 years. We have three amazing kids together who are 7, 4, and 10 months. We've basically grown up together. We're not legally married, but he did propose in 2018 right before we bought our house and we've called each other husband and wife ever since. I'm not going to romanticize our relationship because it's far from perfect, but I always thought we would be the couple to grow old together. He works a very demanding job that my dad also had, so I know the hours are long and I've been a stay-at-home mom for almost five years and homeschool our kids. At first, I stayed home because I was very ill with baby number two, but then he asked me to stay home with our kids as it would be cheaper than daycare. This year, he asked me to homeschool as well. We've recently been in very rocky waters as I have a never-ending list of expectations and all he has to do is go to work. Because of this, we've talked about separating for a few weeks now, but we don't want to disrupt our kids' routines. Well, in comes a text from my cousin's ex-wife. She explained she needed to reach out to me girl to girl and sent me screenshots of my partner on Tinder. 
The pictures that he'd used were taken a couple of days before, so I know it wasn't an old profile. He used a different name, a name that we had agreed on for a future baby number four if it was a boy. I of course thanked her, but I really didn't want to believe it. He's always talked down on cheaters since his dad was a huge cheater, and it caused a lot of trauma for him and his family. So I made a catfish tender to see for myself. Well, I had no luck, so I just pretended like nothing was wrong and went about our daily lives for a few days. It was extremely hard, especially because I'm not good at hiding my feelings at all. But I couldn't stand the not knowing anymore. Yesterday, I made one of his favorite dinners and even made a pie so he could go into a food coma and go to bed earlier. It worked. He was out by 8.30. I let my older kids stay up to watch a few movies so that bedtime was postponed while I snooped. I have never snooped in his phone or even had a reason to do so. We both have each other's passwords and will use each other's phones often. It's a line that I've always said can't be uncrossed. I found so much, all in plain sight. Not much was hidden. No, Tinder was not on his phone, but he was texting three different numbers that were obviously girls from there. They all called him by the fake name. They sent pictures back and forth. I found at least four different Snapchat threads that were him emotionally cheating with more girls, calling each other babe and honey bun, which is what he calls me. Texts that say he's a single dad and the mom doesn't want anything to do with the kids. All sorts of pictures sent back and forth, and when I thought that was it, I found the hidden pictures folder. I used my phone to take pictures and videos of everything and send them to my email. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them yet, but I have them. Also, I looked back at our text thread on the date that correlates with the video, a month after I gave birth, and saw it was one of the many times he would say he's going out with the boys. He even texted me that night and told me how much he loved me and how he was going to take me to breakfast in the morning. It's funny because I would cry to him around that time and ask if he wasn't in love with me anymore. I would cry and cry and he would hold me and say that he only loved me and that he could never hurt me like his dad hurt his mom. I haven't slept. I don't know him. I'm literally sick to my stomach. I've thrown up all night. But when he woke up this morning, I pretended like I was too tired to get up with him. And the even funnier thing is I have nothing. No money, no family to turn to. I own nothing on my own. We both own the house. No credit cards, bad credit, literally nothing. He didn't even have a lot of money or good credit either. But I'm completely dependent on him and I'm not sure how long I can pretend like nothing is wrong. So I turn to you Redditors. Please tell me what to do. Please give me any useful advice. My best friend is getting married today and I truly think they're making a mistake. I've tried my best to be supportive and gentle in my language if I must be honest, but I'm bursting with frustration. I know this is going to sound petty and honestly, I'm likely a bad friend for judging, but please hear me out. My friend is 23, marrying a man of the same age and they've been dating for about 8 months. At 5 months, they told me they were getting engaged and that they were going to be at the courthouse on Halloween to get married. The only people invited are both of their mothers. A proper wedding ceremony will be held in the spring where everyone will be invited. I've already been told I'm one of the groomsmen slash maids of honor. I'm the best man of the bride, if there's a better name for that. Why do I have a problem with this? Because the very short time they've been dating, my best friend is very quick to fall in love and very quick to fall hard. Every person they've dated in the past five years has had the same thing said about them the best person they've ever dated, and I've never loved someone so much. I genuinely don't mind it normally, as they have lots of love to give, and how much they see love is one of their charms. But it has led to them getting hurt very often, especially by terrible guys who take advantage of their feelings, usually financially. I'm worried they're jumping into this relationship too fast. I've met the fiancé, and I don't hate the guy. He's okay and hasn't shown many red flags. He even makes my friend happy, so I should be happy. The only big red flag is his inability to hold a job, quitting or getting fired frequently, especially quitting without telling my friend. I've talked about my concerns about them rushing this, but they brushed them off and gave me the same, I've never loved anyone like this before. So I've bit my tongue since and try to support them. I even went shopping with them to pick out the wedding outfit like a best friend should. You've already talked about your concerns and that's where it should stop. You're a spectator henceforward to this wedding. Watch quietly. Your friend needs to make her own choices and learn from them. OP. Yeah, I have no plans on talking to them about my concerns anymore or doing anything beyond supporting and witnessing. Even if this does not work out, I don't ever plan on saying I told you so because I truly want this to work for my friend. 
They've dated for eight months, and he's had more than one job during that time? OP. He's had three that I'm aware of. Oh, wow. That's not good. How are the parents not railing against this union? I've switched jobs three times this year, each time for a much better opportunity and a raise. This sort of context is important. Just changing jobs isn't bad these days. If I could go back in time, I wouldn't have invested so much time in my friends' love lives. All it did was cause tension between friends and I wasted so much time and energy. My advice is to let it be. Nothing you say will change her mind. Just be there when and if she needs you. My daughter flipped out on me for eating her shrimp. I, male 51, live with my wife who's 49 and our three kids, our daughter who's 24 and our two sons who are 21 and 14. I pay the mortgage, I pay the bills, I pay for groceries. My wife works and her money goes for our vacations and retirement. We're happy with this arrangement. She makes about $85,000 a year and I make more. My daughter has a job that she got after college. My middle kid works part-time while he's in school to pay for extras. All three of my kids will graduate their undergrad with no debt. I work weird hours and shifts. I'm writing this at 3.30 in the morning because I just got home. There was a note waiting for me on the fridge going off on me for eating a box of firecracker shrimp I found in the freezer and I made myself for supper yesterday. Apparently it was something my daughter had bought for herself. There wasn't any note on it in the freezer or anything. This isn't the first time that this has happened either, but I think it will be the last time. I'm thinking of talking to my wife and asking her to tell my daughter that anything in the freezer or fridge that isn't labeled is fair game or that she has to start paying for all of my groceries that she's consumed. Because she does not buy the basics. She eats all the groceries that my wife buys. I don't really have a problem with her living here rent-free and eating my food while she saves money. I have a problem with her calling me a jerk for eating food I found in my freezer in my house. I should probably add that in the past, I have found out that more than once, food she got actually just meant food that she added to the grocery list that I paid for and her mom shopped for. Am I the jerk? Edit. To answer a bunch of common questions. Just spoke to my wife and my daughter. The shrimp was purchased by our wife using our budget. It was frozen shrimp, not takeout. My daughter has now agreed that if there is food that she purchases with her own money, that she will label it and I will not eat it. And I will make sure that the boys know as well. As for rent, I still want her to save her money. Kids have it hard enough these days. You're the jerk. Because as the parent, you should just talk to your daughter instead of continuing this weird, passive-aggressive, indirect communication by having your wife do it. Your daughter is probably going to have roommates when she moves out. There's a good opportunity to teach her about living with other adults. Everyone sucks here. It was an honest mistake. However, your attitude about your mistake was really harsh. You could tell her to put a basket in the fridge or freezer for her stuff. Yeah, she should label it. But I know I wouldn't think of labeling food where I live. It's weird that you couldn't resolve this in text. It also seems like you're looking for a reason to charge her rent. If you're going to do it, you should have told her when she started working. Doing it as punishment is weird. Info. Why are you so unaware of what groceries are fair game? My significant other and I both work and we both plan the weekly meal plan and grocery list. If you leave all the planning, shopping, and meal prep to your wife, this is a you problem. It seems pretty straightforward. If you didn't ask someone to get you firecracker shrimp, it's probably not your firecracker shrimp, unless you're still yearning for the 50s. You're the jerk. As usual, what the heck are these comments? You know you didn't buy that shrimp yourself. You admit she bought it. So you want permission to eat food you didn't pay for, but the person you should have asked about it was the person it belonged to, not Reddit. And since she was sleeping, you had the whole rest of the fridge and pantry of your groceries to eat. If you're bitter that you pay for groceries and want your kids to contribute to the bills, then be an adult and say so. But that doesn't give you the right to eat prepared food somebody else bought, labeled or not. Would you eat something out of the communal work fridge just because it wasn't labeled, knowing you didn't bring it? Are you that guy? You're the jerk. You are one family. Who gives a hoot that you pay for the groceries and your wife the vacation and retirement? If you claim the groceries now, she has the right to claim the retirement money. What? That doesn't even make sense. You're the jerk. So you think because you're the man of the house, you can just eat whatever you want to in the fridge, even if it doesn't belong to you? That's BS. You need to get your daughter's permission before you eat anything that belongs to her. You honestly sound like a horrible father, so don't be surprised when she goes no contact with you. 
Your kids deserve so much better than an inconsiderate jerk like you. Honestly, if I was her, I'd post a video about this on TikTok to call you out and make sure your job finds out about it. People like you really need to be held accountable. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his daughter? Please let us know. Reading comments on Reddit is the number one way to lose faith in all of humanity. I took our son trick-or-treating without my wife. I'm 29, male, and my wife is 30, and we have a four-year-old son. As Halloween approached this year, my son let me know that he wanted to dress up as characters from his favorite show at the moment. These aren't costumes that are readily available to buy, so I was going to have to do some crafting magic and make them myself. I'm a stay-at-home father, and my wife is something of a workaholic. She could cut down on her hours if she wished, but she's always been a very work-driven and focused person. She's not very maternal. Because of this, my son has never been very attached to her. They have time together at dinner, but even during times when my wife is off work, like during bath time and bedtime, it's always just me. This isn't me complaining. I signed on for this stay-at-home dad life, and I enjoy every minute of it. I just wish, for his sake, that she would be more involved. About a month before Halloween, my son asked if my best friend, who's 35, male, could dress up with us. He had already assigned himself and me as a specific character, and I had started working on the costumes, so I figured it wouldn't be a big deal to add one more. He adores my best friend. They have such a sweet bond, and have since my son was born. I asked best friend if he wanted to join us for trick-or-treating, and he immediately agreed. During dinner, the night following this, I asked him what character he wanted his mom to be. My son said he only wanted to go trick-or-treating with daddy and best friend. Over the course of the next month, I would casually bring it up again to my son, and he continually gave the same answer. My wife was clearly hurt, but would always brush it off. Fast forward to Halloween night. I had spent weeks working on these little costumes for all of us. As we were getting ready, my wife and I got into a big argument over the fact that she didn't have a costume. I pointed out that if she had wanted me to make her one, she could have requested I do so, or she could have gotten one for herself. She said it was ridiculous that the three of us were doing a matching theme and leaving her out of it, and that she wasn't even going. In the end, best friend and I took him trick-or-treating alone, and my wife still isn't speaking to me because she can't believe I actually went without her. Am I the jerk? I have to go with you're the jerk. I'm halfway waiting for the update where you turn the guest room into an art studio for the best friend without discussing it with your wife. Info. Why did you let your four-year-old exclude mom and kind of just roll with it, especially since you say that she was clearly hurt by it and also that you wish they had a stronger bond? Not making a judgment yet, just looking for more clarification on your thought process when he said he didn't want her coming. Not downplaying that she needs to make an effort because she obviously does. It would be great if wife was more involved with your son. It would have been nice if she had expressed a definite interest in participating so you would have had a costume ready for her. When you were planning it, perhaps it would have been a good parenting moment to remind your son that being left out of the fun can hurt people's feelings and there was no reason to exclude mom. You mentioned it would be nice if she was more involved with your son. Maybe she needs a little help feeling wanted since you and your son have already figured out your style of interaction and hers might be a little different, but she doesn't know what it is yet. Maybe doing things together with her, but being careful to make sure she doesn't feel like a third wheel would be a start if part of the problem is her not knowing how to connect with him. I just worry that there is a disconnect because she's gone for too many hours, and then the lack of connection makes her work more to cover and hide being hurt, and what might otherwise have been fixed remains broken forever. Of course, I could be totally misreading the situation. You're the jerk. You do not let a four-year-old decide who is included in family activities. You're the adult in charge, and you should have made sure to include your wife, with a costume that matched. Your entire post comes across as judgmental and whiny. You seem to want to prove that you're the better parent. What's that about? If you're unhappy, talk to your wife. Don't use your son to punish her. Do better by your wife and your son. Imagine if OP was the mom and the dad was the workaholic who wasn't included in the trick-or-treating. Everyone would be saying that dad should be helping with childcare when he gets home from work and that if he wanted to go trick-or-treating, he should have asked beforehand. But as usual, because OP is a man, you all are tearing him to shreds and making excuses for the absent mom. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Communication is very important from all sides. We always have to communicate about things and not just try to blow it off. Am I the jerk for throwing my niece out of my house? 
I, 48 female, have a beautiful daughter, Amelia, who's 17. I'm a single mother because Amelia's father left before she was born and she is my whole entire world. Amelia is also a teen mother to my beautiful grandson, Owen, who's one. I'm obviously not proud of her for being a teen mother, but I am extremely proud of her for how she's handling everything. She's an amazing mother and she's still doing very well in school. She's dating Owen's father, Raymond, who's also 17. He's a lovely kid too. They all live with me in my home and I provide for them financially with some support from Raymond's family. I'm a lawyer and I'm lucky enough to be able to work from home most of the time, so I care for my grandson during the day while Raymond and Amelia are at school. When I have to go into work, Raymond's family looks after Owen. Recently, my sister called and asked me if I could allow her daughter, Stephanie, who's 19, to move in with me. It's difficult to find a place to live in our city, so I agreed to let her move in for free. I'm very big on family taking care of each other, so I didn't want to charge my sister's daughter rent. I immediately noticed that Stephanie was being weird about Amelia being a teen mother. She'd make tasteless jokes, and I immediately took her aside and I told her that I would not tolerate any sort of teasing. I've hired a tutor for both Amelia and Raymond just for extra support, and when Stephanie found out, she rolled her eyes and said, they wouldn't need one if they had just been responsible. She also said that I was rewarding bad behavior, but I told her that I like to take care of my family, just as how I allowed her to move in for free. Then I realized that Stephanie was taking some of Amelia's clothing without permission. When she first moved in, I told her that in my home, we ask for permission before taking other people's belongings, so I was pretty annoyed at it. Amelia asked Stephanie to return a shirt that she had taken and she refused and said that Amelia didn't need it back because she didn't fit into it. Amelia did gain weight as a result of pregnancy and it's made her very insecure. It was a shirt she wore pre-baby and she keeps it so that she can use it to motivate herself to lose weight. I told Stephanie to return it immediately and apologize, but she refused. We got into a massive argument that resulted in me packing her bags and calling her mother to come and get her. Everyone in my family is bombarding me with phone calls calling me a jerk for kicking her out. I fear I may have been too extreme and I could have tried to sort it out before it got bad. Am I the jerk? So, your freeloading niece comes into your rent-free home, bullies your daughter, steals her things, and your family thinks that you're the bad guy for packing her bags? They're having a laugh. Tell them to feel free to take her in if they feel that strongly. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. She's 19 and needs to realize that actions have consequences. It was probably a huge inconvenience for you and it sounds like she needed a reality check. Not the jerk. Stephanie decided to bite the hand that feeds her. If she can't follow the rules, she can't stay. Your other family members can offer their own support if they are that concerned. Not the jerk. But why the comment about not being proud of your daughter for being a teen mother? If my mom had said something like that about me when I had my first baby at 16, I would have been heartbroken. This stigma over teen mothers really needs to stop. Being a mother is a huge accomplishment that you should definitely be proud of her for doing, whether it was intentional or not. Plus, she has a great supportive father who is there for her and their son. It's cool that you're letting them live with you rent-free, but are you doing enough for the baby? The way you say you're not proud of her, I hope you're supporting them enough financially since they are unable to work full-time. Are you buying them enough formula? Are you buying enough clothes and toys for baby? As grandma, I really hope you can step up and stop thinking lowly of your daughter for the miracles she experienced of childbirth. Do better. Am I the jerk for saying it's not my responsibility to watch my coworkers' kids? We work in a food service establishment. All the employees work with the food in the back and then hand it to the customers at the front counter. My coworker can't find a babysitter on most days, so she takes her kids to work and keeps them in the back. They're really hyperactive kids, so she brings a portable crib and an iPad to keep them occupied. Well, the four-year-old already knows how to climb in and out when he gets bored and keeps running around the establishment barefoot and bothering customers. Her one-year-old always tries to do like his brother and constantly climbs out only to fall down on the floor. My coworker uses her phone a lot, so she constantly goes outside for like 15 to 30 minutes at a time to talk on the phone. This is when she tells me to watch her kids while she's out. Usually I have no problem doing so if the store is empty, since I'm usually in the back anyways. But when we're in a rush hour and she does this, it's literally impossible for me to do so. Yesterday this happened. 
she went outside to talk to her boyfriend and left me with her kids, asking me to watch them. But as soon as she left, the family of five came in, so I told the kids to stay calm and set them up with a YouTube video while I took their orders. As I'm taking their order, I hear a loud thump. A second later, I hear a scream from the smaller one. I apologize to the family and excuse myself. When I go check on the kids, the baby is again on the floor, staring at me crying. I check that he's okay, and he is. I pick him up and finish taking the order with him on the side of my hip. Right then, my coworker walks in and asks what happened. I tell her. She tells me how she asked me to watch them. Then a customer chimes in, saying they thought the kid was mine. I said no, and then she tells my coworker that it's not my responsibility to watch her kid since that's not the job I'm getting paid for. My coworker gets her kid and goes to the back. After a while, the store emptied again, and my coworker started talking about how rude the lady was and how it's just a favor I'm doing for her. I said, she's right though, and before I could even blink, I was getting called all sorts of names. Now she complained about me to our boss, and I'm being lectured about teamwork and empathy. I just simply don't understand when this one-time favor turned into part of my job description. So, am I the jerk? If this is a chain store, call corporate and the regional manager. They need to know that there are kids in the crib on site. Let them deal with that. There's no way I would take that lecture from my boss. Tell the coworker and your boss that you will no longer be babysitting. That's outside the scope of your job description. Not the jerk. Also, start looking for another job. Apply today. My dad told me to just walk home, so I did. A long time ago, in the faraway year of 1999, I was 11 years old and finishing my last year in elementary school. Right before my birthday, which was in May, my parents called the family together for a meeting. They told us my mom had gotten a new job and we would need to move. We weren't moving too far away, only about an hour, but that still meant moving away from my friends and going to a completely different middle school than the one I thought I'd be going to. Elementary school wrapped up and we moved to our new house in early July. In August, my parents and I got to take a tour of the school and meet the principal and some of the teachers. That was when we learned there weren't any buses that passed our new neighborhood. It was actually close to the school, so that meant I would be walking to and from there every day. My parents weren't too thrilled about this, but it was only 15 to 20 minute walk and there was a path, so they came around on that idea pretty quickly. At the time, both of my parents worked full time and five days a week. My mom worked Monday through Friday and my dad worked Monday through Thursday and Saturday. Trust me, this is relevant. Since my older sister was away in college full time and they didn't trust me and my brother alone, my parents found a babysitter to be there when my brother and I would get home and watch us until my parents got home. My brother was two years younger than me and in the local elementary school. The school year started and in early September we got a massive heat wave that reached highs of like 96 degrees for a couple of days. The middle school was also an old building and most of it was not air conditioned. I only had two classes that had AC in the classroom throughout the day. At the end of those days, I was tired and not in any mood to walk an additional 20 minutes in the heat before getting home, so I used vending machine snack money to call the babysitter from the payphone. Cell phones were definitely not used by kids in those days. The babysitter, thinking he was just not letting me suffer in the heat, came to pick me up and I would do some homework before Batman Beyond and Pokemon came on. I did try to call home two more times over the next two weeks when it was hot. The second time I got the sitter again, the third time I called was on a Friday. My dad answered. He was not happy with me. He told me it wasn't that hot, 85 degrees that day, that I shouldn't call the sitter away from the house and that I had to start growing up. He told me to walk home and we would talk more when I got there. So I walked home. I got a lecture and was told to not call the sitter again to be picked up. I said okay and told him I wouldn't call the sitter again or him again to be picked up. Two weeks later, at the end of September, a hurricane passed through the area. Halfway through the day at school, it really started coming down. It got so bad that they let us out of school a half hour early, like that was going to save us. By this time though, a lot of roads were flooded and the line for payphones was long. I remember what my dad told me a couple weeks ago, so I walked home. It took me almost 30 minutes to walk home from school that day and I was drenched by the time I got home. The rain was coming down so hard I couldn't see more than 5 feet in front of me. The roads were so flooded that the only way to drive in it was with a car that had 4 wheel drive. When I got home, both my parents, mom got out of work early due to the storm, were there panicking because they hadn't heard from either the school or me. 
I just walked in through our garage, soaking wet, and said, Hi mom, hi dad, I'm home. After they got over the initial shock and relief of seeing me home, my parents and I had this conversation. Mom, how did you get home? Me, I walked. Why? Dad told me to. When? We didn't get any calls from you or the school today. Me, well, a couple weeks ago I called the sitter a few times and asked for a ride home since it was hot. The last time I called, I got dad. He told me I had to just walk home from now on and not to call for a ride again. Dad, I implied that there could be exceptions. You didn't say that. My mom turned on my dad and just told me to dry myself off and put my wet clothes in the dryer. I was drying myself off and I could hear them arguing. It was louder than the rain. When I was done and put my clothes in the dryer, my parents talked to me and told me I was allowed to call home but only for emergencies. The next day, Saturday, my dad took me out to Blockbuster and I was told I could rent up to five movies for myself. He also paid for pizza that night and I got a whole pepperoni pizza for myself. That pizza lasted two days and no one else was allowed to touch it. My dad never lived that down. Good times. I just blew up at my family and I have honestly never felt better. For some background, I, 25 male, am the only male in my family, not including my son and nephews. Over the years, I have often been the forgotten one in the family or the one who's expected to just give things up for others. However, more often recently, it's been the constant need for favors, from building furniture, to sorting out different technology, to being the adult figure at an event for the younger ones due to them being unable to make it. For example, when growing up, I would often be left home alone while the others in my family went out for meals or for a girl's day. They even went on holidays without me. Or I would be expected to take my dad's old clothes. He lived separately from my mom, while my sisters got brand new everything, from clothes to big trips to having their prom entirely paid for while I had to stay home during my prom. So on to what caused me to blow up. Yesterday was Father's Day, as mentioned. I have a son myself, and since I am the only male, I am also the main role model for my nephew. I do not want to sound whiny, but this is now the fourth year in a row that I have been completely forgotten about. I'm a simple person, so I do not expect nor like big celebrations or gifts. I just wanted a simple message saying Happy Father's Day. Now I would usually be able to ignore this and move on, however Mother's Day in our family has always been a huge event, with constant gifts, meals, etc. Wishing for a simple message seems so small in comparison, so I didn't feel like I was asking too much. It was not as if they had completely forgotten about it, as various members of the family posted about Father's Day including little posts for those who have unfortunately passed on or are no longer part of the main family unit, like my father. So this ended with me blowing up at my family for constantly asking me for favors and to make sacrifices when I can't even get the smallest bit of acknowledgement in return. Honestly, I said a lot of things that I've been holding in for the longest time and I don't think I have ever felt better getting it off my chest. Edit. As for what people have been asking, I've tried to talk to my family in the past about feeling like I have been treated unfairly. Communication isn't my strong point. I was diagnosed with high-functioning autism or Asperger's just last year, and it's always resulted in my family, mainly my mother and sister, accusing me of lying or misremembering stuff. As for the blow-up, it resulted in my mother lying about getting me something every single year. Not true, as I keep absolutely everything that has anything to do with my son or Father's Day, and then trying to make me feel guilty for being angry, followed by her quickly leaving the family group chat. My sister, however, quickly jumped in and started trying to belittle me as a father and defend my mother, followed by removing me from the group chat before I could reply. The only one on my side in all of this is my grandmother, who's the only one to treat me fairly. Overall, both my sister and mother completely missed the point I was trying to make and acted like I had asked for a huge celebration for me when all I had said was that I give a lot to the family. It would have been nice to get a simple message from them. What specifically did you say when you blew up? Did you blow up at everyone all at once? Was it in person? What was their reaction? OP. We have, more accurately now, had a family group chat. Just after midnight on Father's Day, I sent a simple message in there telling everyone that I will no longer be doing people favors. When asked why, I simply asked them what day it was. This was followed by my mother claiming not to have had internet connection all day, despite sharing things on Facebook throughout the day and claiming to have gotten me something every year, which is just completely not true, as ever since my son was born, I've kept anything to do with him in various memory boxes, from cards to gifts to little school things he's done. 
This was followed by me calling her out personally in the chat for not making any effort with me for years, pointing out that she has messaged me twice this year and visited my house three times in the last three years, but then always expecting me to make constant effort for her and do favors. We live less than 10 minutes apart. My mother then left the chat and hasn't messaged me since. My sister then jumped in and started saying I was being unfair by calling out my mother and tried to belittle me, and then quickly removed me from the group chat before I could reply. Update. Following me blowing up at my family, I received multiple messages either belittling me, playing the victim, or calling me unfair. So after a lot of people giving me the same advice, I've decided to cut them out of my life, mainly my mother and sister. I'm still in contact with my grandmother and younger cousins as they have genuinely done nothing wrong and have been on my side. However, my mother has decided to be petty. In our family, each of us pays for a different streaming service and share the accounts. My mother decided to change the password to her account and kicked me off of it, so I've done the same thing with the service I pay for. I will, however, be logging my cousins and grandmother back into it, but not revealing the password. So yeah, I've cut off the ones who would make me feel worthless, and they've decided to be petty in return. Am I the jerk for refusing to cook for my wife anymore after she ate three of my meal prep meals? In my household, my wife doesn't cook. She's not good at it, and it's just easier on our taste buds if I cook for us. Earlier this year, we both decided that it was time for us to get back in shape. I decided to research some healthy cooking recipes and got big into meal prepping. My wife stuck with it for a few weeks, but ultimately decided to quit. Luckily, this wasn't too much of an issue for me. She's a nurse and frequently works much later than I do, as my typical workday is from 6am to 2pm. So I would do my meal prep for the week on my day off, and then I would make my dinner like I did prior. When I meal prep, I make six days worth of three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and just swap around lunch and dinner. Last week, Thursday morning I left for work and planned on coming back Friday morning and stopping through home and grabbing anything that I needed before heading to the office. This was known for weeks in advance, so I didn't spring this on my wife. I figured that she would be able to make sure she and our kid got dinner that night and breakfast the next morning. The next morning, I'm running late and drive through home looking for my last breakfast and lunch for the week, and they're gone. I don't have time to ask my wife, nor do I want to wake her up early before her shift, so I just go. I end up skipping breakfast and lunch. I get off of work and I'm starving and decide I'm just going to eat dinner early, and when I look for my dinner for that night, it's not there. This is what sets me off. When my wife gets home, I ask her what's up, and she admits to eating the meals. I tell her that I had portioned out food for an entire day, and she had ate all of it in a single night. She said it was my fault, as I didn't make anything for her and our kid to eat, and I just left the meal prep things, so that's what they ate. We got into an argument, and she told me I was being selfish. So now I decided that if I'm selfish for expecting her to feed herself for one night, I would just not cook anymore, as I'm doing a lot of work for a selfish person. For the past week, I made my meal prep meals and store them at work, and let her figure out what she wants to do for dinner by herself. Of course I still cook for our kid, but only one portion small enough for him to eat by himself. I told her I would keep this up, and that she should learn how to cook for herself if she's not happy about it. She told me that she's too tired when she comes home from work to cook, and that I'm being incredibly petty. I think I'm justified, and I'm pushing her to learn a life skill that she should have had by now. Am I the jerk? Is it petty? 100%. Is it deserved petty? 100%. To be called selfish because you expect her to figure something out for one night is ridiculous and insulting. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for telling my sister the world doesn't revolve around her and her son? I, 24 female, am getting married to my fiancé, male 26, in October of this year. We got engaged in January and couldn't be more excited. It's a very small wedding and we're only inviting close family and friends. The problem is with my sister, Lisa, who's 30. Lisa has a two-year-old son with her husband. I don't have a super affectionate relationship with Lisa for multiple reasons that I can't fit into this post. We sent out the wedding invites last month. Our wedding ceremony starts at 1.30 p.m. and we asked our guests to please arrive at the venue by 1. The venue is in our hometown, so it's close by the majority of the people in our guest list, including Lisa. Lisa told me that the time wouldn't work because of her two-year-old's nap schedule. She said he takes a nap at 12 and that she's not forcing him to be awake so she can take him to get ready for the event or he will be a terror. I don't have kids, but I thought this was a silly reason. I asked Lisa if she could find a babysitter 
and she said that she can't because everyone she trusts will be at the wedding. I suggested that they at least attend the reception, but she said she won't if she can't be at the wedding. She told me she won't attend the wedding unless we change the time. I told her that we can't do that. Lisa said she's not going then. I was quite hurt by this. I wasn't sure how to react in the moment, so I just abruptly ended the conversation with an excuse. A few days later, Lisa asked me if I thought about her suggestion. I reminded her that there's no way we can change the time. She told me she hopes I'm happy that they aren't attending and said that everyone is going to ask why she's not there and it's all because I can't accommodate my nephew. I snapped at her and told her the world doesn't revolve around her and her son. She called me a bridezilla and has blocked me. My mom is pestering me to make amends with Lisa, but I just don't think I'm the one in the wrong. Not the jerk. Wow, I see why you don't have a good relationship. She's doing the best she can to make your day about her. Ask mom how exactly she wants you to make amends. She told you she won't come to your wedding because her son needs a nap. That's so petty. Am I the jerk for not giving my sister the wedding gift she wanted because of how she treated my girlfriend? My girlfriend, Naomi, and I have been together for over a decade. My younger sister, Sarah, and my girlfriend have never been super close but are friendly when we get together. Or I guess they were. When Sarah was in high school, Naomi helped her out with some personal things. Sarah got married a few years ago. When Sarah announced her engagement to the family, she asked Naomi to be a bridesmaid, which surprised us a little, but Naomi was very excited because she's never gotten to do it before and probably won't have the chance. I want to be clear that there was no suggestion from either of us Sarah should ask her. It was about two seconds after she told us she was engaged. She said that she was so grateful to Naomi for the help when she was younger and Naomi was very touched. A few weeks later, Sarah posts her bridesmaid proposal brunch. Naomi wasn't there. Sarah never said it to either of our faces directly, but clearly she had changed her mind. Naomi was hurt, but said she understood because she hadn't expected the ask anyway. That would have been fine, but then a few months later, Sarah asks Naomi to go to the bachelorette party and also to go get ready with her on the day of with her friends and bridesmaids. Same thing, Naomi says yes and even helped her find a good place to go and a rental. A month and a half before the wedding, I'm talking to my mom on the phone and she mentions that Sarah's at her bachelorette. No mention of it to Naomi. Now I'm kind of upset because Naomi was clearly very hurt at two invites and then being sort of ghosted. A week before the wedding, Naomi texted Sarah and asked about getting ready and hair and makeup and Sarah responds acting confused and basically tells her nicely to just come with me. Then I was really upset. Sarah wanted this really expensive baking mixer thing for a long time and I got it for her for her wedding gift. My mom had ruined the surprise so she expected it. But after everything with Naomi, I felt like being petty so I cut her a check instead and returned the mixer. A few days after the wedding, Sarah texts me saying, I don't know how to ask this but what happened to the mixer? And I responded I didn't know how to ask but what happened to treating my girlfriend like a human being? Now my brother and my new brother-in-law and my mom are all texting me saying that I'm ruining her happy time. Naomi says that I probably shouldn't have done that but she feels a little vindicated. Am I the jerk? Update. So I talked to Sarah and things just got more confusing. She said when she asked Naomi to be a bridesmaid, she meant an honorary bridesmaid. She then said for the bachelorette party, Naomi had told her she works most weekends so she didn't think that Naomi was able to attend and was just helping her to plan. Naomi said that she told Sarah to give her date so she could take off. Naomi is a very non-confrontational person and had asked me to not bring up the bridesmaid or bachelorette thing because she didn't want to feel like she was pushing in at the time which is why I didn't. The makeup thing my sister said that Naomi had told her that she would do her own hair so she didn't see a reason for her to come get ready with them. My sister is still upset with me and says I ruined her honeymoon and some other really crappy stuff so I just hung up on her. She also said that not giving her the mixer was rude to her and her husband which is hilarious. Party of 12 did not want to tip. The restaurant I work at has a policy, like many restaurants do, that if we get a party of 8 plus people, we automatically include 20% gratuity into the tip. We don't end up pocketing the full 20% as we have to include the sales tax into it, so we're not taxing guests on the tip, so it's usually a guaranteed 18% tip, which is usually around $80 to $100 depending on the party. We inform the guests of this before they're even put on the wait list, so they're free to go somewhere else if they're not comfortable with it. Last Sunday, we were very busy in the morning. We were getting party after party 
I ended up with a 12 top. It was an older guy, his wife, and what I presume was his daughters and their kids. The older guy and his wife I had served previously and they were very kind and he orders quite a bit of alcohol running up the tab so I was excited to serve them. From the moment I greeted them, I knew they were going to be a problem and they were going to complain about the 20%. Almost all of them had something wrong with their food. Not enough fries, not enough butter on the potato, the sauces taste weird, etc. They do three checks. I give it to them and one of the daughters immediately starts getting loud about the tip. She asks what the additional charge is and I explain to her it's the 20% gratuity they were informed about before they were set and she goes on a 5 minute tangent about how it's unacceptable that we put that on there without her consent and that we were taxing her for the tip. I thoroughly explain to her how the number was calculated and tell her I can get the manager because he's the one that put it on there. She pulls out her phone and starts doing the calculations and says, We'll let you know when we're ready. Matter of fact, why don't you go ahead and grab the manager? I bring him over, he says exactly what I told them, and the daughter starts with, First of all, the service was crap, which was blatantly rude and disgusting. They were my only table for most of the time I served them and I was constantly running back and forth because they kept asking for more and more stuff. He ends up talking to the other daughter for like 20 minutes and she tells him that they all used to be servers back in the day, to which I audibly laughed. One of my coworkers then comes up to me and says that one of the daughters approached her because she usually serves them and she told the daughter that because it was super busy, she couldn't take any request tables. The daughter says, We had a geek nerd serve us. And her husband, who's holding his baby, says, He was the worst server we've ever had. I ended up getting the 20% tip, but will never be serving these people again. Grocery store employee accuses me of stealing. Worst mistake she ever made. I'm male, 24, if it means anything, I guess. So the title sounds bad, I'm sure. This afternoon, I had to take off from work for a few hours to take my grandma to a doctor's appointment. As such, I was dirty from working and in my normal work clothes, denim shirt and jeans along with some greasy boots. While she was in at the appointment, I went to the Safeway across the street, the one I shop at for her every week to get groceries and whatever else she needs, to get her some baby aspirin and find myself a Gatorade. While I was looking around, trying to find a cold one, I noticed the olive bar. You fill up a container with olives and then you wait at the register. So I got myself a container of olives and peppers and went walking off to the register. The deli manager, who I've talked to a hundred times at this store, mind you, yells to me, You need us to label that so you can pay. They haven't ever done this, so I asked her, When did that start? It's always been like that. Bring it over. No, it hasn't. I've always waited at the register. What's the code for them? If you've done it at the register before, you'll know the code. I leave it up to the cashier. Then I started walking to the register. She then yells at me. This is why we have to raise prices. People like you. So I said some things I'm not proud of. I'll paraphrase here. I walked up to the deli counter and asked her directly. Are you accusing me of trying to steal olives? I didn't accuse you of anything. Oh, good. Because for a minute there... I thought you were being a profiling jerk and accusing me of stealing $2 worth of olives when I spend around $1,000 a month in this store. And when I went to walk away, she said something under her breath and stared at me while I walked away, then shouted, Next time, just pay for them. So I turned around and called her everything I had boiling up and told her to call the cops and I'll stand right here with the olives I'm trying so hard to steal. And then I said, Don't worry. I can wait a minute for your big self to get around here to detain me since I'm such a criminal. She then waddled off into the back office and I went off to find the floor manager and told him what happened. Then he looked upset and went off to go find her. I set the crap down and just left because I wasn't about to give them any business. Anyway, am I the jerk? Edit. The manager of the store agreed that the store policy is to weigh the olives at the checkout and he also apologized and stomped off towards the deli after I told him who the worker was that did that. So anyone questioning policy, hopefully that clears things up. How is anyone excusing this absolute tantrum? You're the jerk. You're a grown man. If an employee of the store states that policy is to get a sticker at the deli, get a sticker. Insulting her like that was so unnecessarily cruel. Her job is to make sure you pay for the olives and even if she was rude about it, I doubt that was the case. No one deserves the kind of insults you used.
PSA. If you're posting something like, am I the jerk for going off on this worker or stranger, etc., it's probably going to be that you're the jerk. Yeah, sometimes they did something to provoke you and you may feel like you have a leg to stand on, but you're just a jerk if you choose to escalate the situation and lay into people. You can always just walk away. Exactly. Yelling is so rarely necessary or justified. I wonder what universe y'all are living in. An employee insinuates you're stealing while you haven't even left the store, yells at you, and OP is expected to shrug it off? The employee deserved every word OP said. Unnecessarily cruel? The manager even confirmed it was checkout at the counter. So the employee was the real jerk here. Probably will get downvoted for this, but I don't care. I'd never let myself be treated the way that OP was. No, they did not deserve the personal insults. Asking her to call the manager to confirm or dismiss the process? Sure. Starting to hurl personal insults and yell? No. You're the jerk. It's people like you that make it extra rough for those working in customer service such as the food sector. There's a shortage of workers, and since you didn't feel the need to have your stuff weighed because it wasn't your normal protocol, you had to unleash your word filth onto that employee. Not the jerk. This is a little something I like to call, she messed around and found out. Excuse me, but if you accuse me of stealing without proof, I will do whatever it takes to cause you to lose your job. But before that, I will do everything I can to ruin your day. To all these people complaining about your hurtful words, do you idiots think it doesn't hurt to be accused of stealing? Hopefully this jerk will learn to treat customers with respect now. Thanks for being a good person, not being a doormat, and putting this Karen in her place. It's about time someone taught her a lesson. By the way, if the roles were reversed, everyone would be siding with you. The only reason they're all excusing how she acted is because you're a dude. Karen cheated on me with her cousin. Now she's demanding to move back into my apartment and to bring him with her. So I, 21 male, have an ex, Angelica, 20 female. Angelica and I had an on and off relationship since we were about 15, but we got serious when lockdown hit and I had to move back to my hometown. We got an apartment together and very soon after, she started spending a lot of time with her cousin. Long story short, she's been hooking up with him. We break up. We've been broken up for nine months at this point. For seven of those months, her phone has been on my phone bill, and she owes me over $500. Fine, whatever. I'll never see that $500, and she always makes excuses to pay me back. That's life, my own fault for letting her keep using me as a cash cow. She also took my car when we broke up, and I let her because I was too afraid she would try to take my apartment too. Anyway, it's nine months past our breakup. I get a message. Hey, I'm pregnant. I'm on my way home from work, so I don't respond. That's nine months past being my problem. It's not my baby. She messages me again. My boyfriend, the one she cheated on me with, and I have nowhere to stay. Still, nine months past my problem. Angelica has never worked a day in her life. She lives off the disability check from her boyfriend and spends 99% of it on grass and fast food. She never paid rent and is documented to never pay rent. Anyway, she tells me, My name is still on the lease. We're going to move in in September. I tell her, Your name is not on the lease. It was renewed last month and I took your name off. I'm sorry. She messages me, calling me a jerk, and saying she's moving in because she has nowhere for her baby and three dogs to stay. Mind you, my apartment is more like a studio and barely fits me, let alone two other people and three dogs. I tell her it's not happening. I'm moving out of town soon anyway. Also, come pick up her crap that she left at my apartment for nine months. She says no, and if I throw it away, she's going to press charges. I tell her it doesn't matter because when I move out, I'm throwing it away. She later called my landlord and told him I was planning to move out. I got upset at this and told her I ran the numbers on the car. It's still in my name. Get the car out of my name now or I'm repossessing it or she can leave me alone. She started bawling on a call, asking how I could do this to her and her unborn kid and I was condemning her and her kid to be homeless. I'm really considering repossessing the car since it was mine from the start and it still is in my name. She doesn't deserve to get a free car handed to her. She needs to wake up. She keeps saying she needs a place to stay. I'm ruining her and her baby's life. It's literally my apartment that she has never once paid rent on. I don't know how she thinks she's entitled to just live in my apartment with a guy she cheated on me with and three dogs. I hope the baby ends up okay 
It's not its fault its mother is a spoiled brat, but I also hope being homeless and carless wakes her up. Karen's brats keep kicking my door. Huge mistake. For context, I, 18 female, live with my two siblings, my sister who's 22 and brother who's 24. Recently, new people moved in right next to us and they have kids. They were a bit loud, which was kind of annoying, but they were kids and kids tend to be loud. I didn't really have a problem with them until they started ding-dong ditching us. I don't even know if it could be considered ding-dong ditch because they literally just kick the door like they're trying to impersonate the FBI. They hang out in front of our house and do it every 10 to 20 minutes. Keep in mind, they kick hard. My sister was going to call the police in a fit of rage, but I told her no because talking to their parents or calling the police might make it worse. I don't know the kid's situation at home. Confronting the parents might make it bad for them but they keep doing it more often and even kicking the door harder. There are literally dents and scuffs on the door now. I don't know how it's possible because they don't look like they're older than 10 and I'm seriously getting annoyed and so are my siblings. They clearly don't see the security camera right in front of the door, so I know their intelligence is lacking, so I'm not gonna yell at them. So I wrote a note on a sign in front of the door, kindly asking them to stop because my siblings work from home and it's extremely distracting but it keeps happening. They even ripped up our sign. So I can't take it anymore. I slipped on some socks and slippers and I went next door to talk to their parents. The mom said it's not that big of a deal. My door wasn't seriously damaged and that they're just kids and they're trying to have fun. And if it's that distracting, I should put on some headphones. But the last straw is when these kids messed with my package outside the door. They shook it and threw the box against the stairs. I snapped and decided to take screenshots of all the security footage of them being little menaces. I made a poster with their faces on it, the damage that they've done, and photo evidence of them being menaces. I typed out, Neighbors, be on the lookout. Local doorstep gremlins may terrorize your front door, which I found funny at the time. I print it out and tape it all over the neighborhood. My other neighbor finds it hilarious because those kids have been doing the same thing to her and she confronted the parents too and the parent did absolutely nothing. But today, I got a giant knock on my door, and it wasn't the little snot-nosed brats, it was the mom. She called me all kinds of names for humiliating her kids. She said that her kids were crying and were now scared to go outside. She yells at me and drops pieces of the ripped up poster on my doormat and walks away. Am I the jerk, or did these brats have it coming? Edit. One, why didn't I call the police in the first place? Well, because they couldn't do much more than give the don't do this, don't do that talk. The scuffs are dense and they aren't even that bad. Ugly, but maybe a paint pen and some rice will fix it. Another reason I didn't call the police in the first place is because I didn't know the situation that they're in at home. Calling the cops could have enraged the parents and made things even worse. I don't know if their home life is troubled. But as soon as I saw that their mother acted like this, I saw a reason to humiliate them. I find that kids have a giant fear of being embarrassed and not coming off as cool as they seem to be. 2. What did I say to the mother? I just said that it was extremely distracting and disrespectful. I told her that there were dents and scuffs on the door and I showed her the video evidence in the phone. I politely asked her to talk to them to tell them that this was affecting us in a negative way and you already know the answer. 3. Will I call the police if it happens again? Yes and no. 911 is reserved for real emergencies and I'm sure there's more serious problems than some neighborhood brats. Resources are plenty but thin. I don't want to take them up. If this does happen again, I won't call 911. I'll just file a complaint or call a non-emergency line. Not the jerk. Kids decided to play some stupid games and got some stupid prizes. What did they think was going to happen? Also, I'm sad their mom's allowing this. If she's like this now, I'd hate to imagine what she'll allow in the future once they're teens. Neighborhood justice was served. Good on you and I hope they stop hitting your door completely. My wife admits that she cheated on me, but she says it doesn't count since we weren't married yet. I'm 25 male, she's 23 female. The time frame is important here. We've been married for three years, we were together as a couple for two years before that, so we've been together for about five years total. Two weekends ago, her sister got married, and of course, my wife was in the wedding party. So as you would expect, she spent the two weeks prior to the wedding helping her sister get everything ready, no big deal at all. She kept me informed and I knew this was going to happen. She took that Wednesday through Friday off work to help her and in fact stayed with her three days. I certainly know her sister, but I barely know the guy who is now my brother-in-law. In fact, I've only met him a few times 
but he seems nice enough. I show up Saturday morning and a few hours before the ceremony in hopes of stealing just a few minutes to see her, not wanting to intrude on the day since I know that she's busy, but I hadn't seen her since Tuesday. She sees me outside of her parents' house and sends her brother out to tell me that she will come out and see me at the car, which I thought was odd, but whatever. She finally comes out and sits in the seat next to me and gives me a kiss, but instead of acting happy to see me or whatever, she tells me that she has to talk to me and she doesn't want it to ruin her sister's day. She informs me that at the reception, if I still want to go, I might hear some things about the best man in her and she didn't want it to be awkward or weird. I just kind of sat there stunned. She said that about four years ago she had a fling with him and that it didn't mean anything, but she was aware that by nature I'm somewhat jealous and she wanted me to know in advance so that if I heard something that I wouldn't be surprised. Again, I kind of just sat there. This was not how I thought my morning would go, but I told her I appreciated knowing it and that it certainly wasn't a big deal now. She went back in the house and I went to eat lunch and decided to meet her at the church. As I'm eating and reading my phone, it dawns on me. She said she had a fling with him four years ago and we've been together for five. My first reaction was to blow it off and think that she just told me the wrong time frame, but the more I thought about it, the more I started to remember, after about a year and a half of us being together, she had a phase where she was really sketchy about her behavior, wasn't available when she normally was, and went on two weekend camping trips that were with friends from work. Of course, I'm a little nodded over this, but I know I have a long day ahead of me. I go to the wedding and sit there watching everything. After the wedding, they have a line that you walk by and congratulate the bride and groom, and the wedding party is standing in line as well. My wife is standing with some other guy, I don't know him at all, but the best man was there and I just went down the line and acted like no big deal. Got to the reception and it takes forever for them to get there because of photos. She finally gets there and sits with me. I decided not to say anything as I didn't want to distract from the day, but instead of just letting it go, she then tells me that each of the groomsmen and bridesmaids are going to dance and that she's going to be dancing with him. I ask why when she was not his partner for the party and she said that the maid of honor and her partner were actually married and wanted to dance with each other. At this point, I'm a little more than perturbed, but I try and not let it show. Thankfully, I was smart enough to not drink because I freely admit I get angry when I drink, so I know when to stay away from it. She talks to everyone around her and then the dance comes and he comes over and extends his arm and she gets up. I try not to watch and in fact, I make it a point not to. She comes back with him in tow and they're joking like the best of friends. She decides that it would be a good idea to introduce us and while I didn't say to buzz off like I wanted to, my greeting to him was probably less than cordial. But it did not deter him from sitting and talking with her for a few minutes. The more they sat and talked and reminisced about old times and places, the madder I got. Eventually I got up and went to the bathroom and when I came back, he was gone. She decided to tell me that she thought I was rude, which was not what I was all about hearing at the moment. I told her that this wasn't the time nor place to talk about it but rest assured we would talk later. She sat there and then said that she was going to change clothes and as soon as she got back, she was telling her sister that we were leaving because I had ruined her day, but she didn't want me to ruin her sister's day as well. I told her that I was perfectly capable of not being a bother to her or her sister the rest of the day and that I did not want to be the cause of any drama, so I would prefer to just stay. She went and changed clothes and then came back all in a huff. Now understand, I have not said a word to her I even shook the other guy's hand. I guess I just looked miserable, so that's what she was basing all of this off of. She was adamant about not staying, and so I said that if she really wanted to go, we could go, but if she would rather stay, I would be happy to stay, or if she would like, since I came in my own car, I could leave and she could stay. She at first said that we should stay, but then said if I couldn't act any better, I should leave. I asked how I was acting, and she said it was obvious I was trying to be a silverback gorilla wanting to fight. I didn't know whether to laugh or be offended. I went back in and sat down while she mingled with the other guests. I talked with her brother for a while, but then ultimately ended up back at our table talking with her grandma. We leave at the same time and I arrived home just before she did. I was sitting in the living room waiting on her when she came in and did not beat around the bush. I simply asked her to retell me the story about the other guy and she said it word for word like before. After sitting and looking at her for a minute, I just said, are you sure about the time frame? and she said she was. I then reminded her that we had been together for five years, so this fling was well over a year into us being together. What happened next, I can't really put into words. Instead of being flustered or denying or anything, she simply said, I know. 
So I asked her to explain, and she tells me that they worked together, and that it was just a physical thing, and she felt like we weren't in a great place at the time, and that she never had any feelings for him, and never had any real intentions of leaving me. She just was having some fun for a few weekends. She said that it was probably a mistake on her part to tell me now, but she didn't want me to get blindsided. I did not take this the way that she thought I would, I guess. We had a very large argument, and it ended when she told me I was being childish about all of this. That we were married, and this happened way before that, and our life together now has nothing to do with him or that time. Well, two things. One, I adamantly disagree about this has no bearings on us. She cheated on me and doesn't even have the decency to feel guilty about it. Two, I hate being told that I'm being childish when I'm upset over something. It upsets me to no end because that's her way of acting superior to me. I told her I needed time to think and she told me there was nothing to think about. We loved each other and this didn't change anything. That was two weeks ago and I'm still not over it. She's been trying the past few days to get me to talk to her, but I admit that for whatever reason, I'm not viewing her the same as I did before this. Part of me is like, this is stupid. It happened a few years ago and we're married now and there haven't been any problems at all. But then part of me is like, I just found out she cheated on me and it really hurts. And what makes it worse is that instead of trying to understand how I feel, she's trying to guilt me into just not even thinking about it. I don't know what to do. Update. First, I want to clarify something from my first post. The maid of honor, not my wife, was married to the groomsman whom my wife walked down the aisle with. There were some other people who felt my wife was trying to arrange the dance, but I do know for a fact that this part was legit. To be blunt, I'm in limbo. There have been developments, but all they've done is made it harder for me to decide. Last week I was mostly angry, then as the weekend progressed I became mostly sad. I still love her and this is ripping me apart. Here's what's happened so far. She finally came to the realization that I was not going to just get over this. This then brought her to the realization that I might want out of the marriage. This then brought a near nervous breakdown from her. Many of you stated that she would try and manipulate me like that, and believe me, I was taking those words to heart when I thought she was having crocodile tears. But it soon became apparent to me that she wasn't acting or faking. She was having a legit panic attack. This led to an ER visit, and that led to an overnight stay in the hospital, and then to new medications and a scheduled follow-up with her doctor for later this week. This brought her family into it, and that in turn led to long conversations all the way around. When we got home, with her family in tow, I asked what she wanted to do since there was a house full of people and she said she wanted to be with her mom for a while. That was fine with me as I had no desire to hang around all day with her dad or sister so I said I was going to finish up something at work and would be home later. Two hours after I get there, I get a text from her begging me to please come home and that she really needs me to talk with her. So I finish up what I was doing and I head home. I'm greeted on my own front porch by her dad who asks if he can talk to me for a minute. My anger level was already somewhat high, but I was ready to go to war if she had lied to him about me. I mean, it's not like he and I are best friends or anything, but I've never had a bad moment with him, so I really wasn't going to be happy about being the jerk who broke his baby's heart. We sat on our deck chairs, and he floored me with what he said. I was expecting to hear anything but what he said. He said that she had told them what had happened, and that he wanted to apologize to me, because he said that he felt like he did a really bad job as a parent and that this mindset that she had was really a creation of her mother's, and that while he loved both of them, he said they were wrong, and he told his wife years ago that telling the girls that whatever happens before marriage doesn't count was a horrible idea and value system to install in them. He then said that he wasn't there to stand up for what his daughter did, but he just wanted me to be aware that what she was saying and how she was acting was simply because she honestly believed that being married was an entirely different life, and that they, mom and dad, had romanticized marriage to the point that she wasn't understanding real life. Basically, he was kind of throwing his wife under the bus, but again, this is not what I was expecting at all. We shook hands, and he said that no matter what I decided, he still thought very highly of me, which honestly made me feel really good for that moment. I then went inside, and my wife is curled up in a ball on her mom's lap, and you can tell she's been crying the entire time I've been gone. Mom gets up and comes and hugs me, and tells me she's sorry and that she loves me, and she's praying that we can work this out. My wife is laid out on the couch at this point. Her mom and dad leave, and she sits there looking at me and crying. Okay, this is where I'm going to upset everybody and just tell you that I couldn't take it. I went to her and we hugged for a long time, but with her telling me over and over how sorry she was. Hey, I know it was the weak thing to do, 
But again, I have to say in my defense that just before this incident occurred, I loved her with all of my heart and would have done anything to not see her in pain. Whatever she had done, I still didn't want to see her like that. Look, it's very possible that she was putting on an Oscar-worthy acting job, but I don't honestly think so. She really seemed broken at this point in time. After a while, when she calmed down, I asked her what she wanted me to come home and talk about, and she said she wanted to get everything out in the open so I didn't feel like I was being lied to or manipulated. So she wanted me to ask her questions, and I wish I had written down a list, but I came up with a few off the top of my head. She was brutally honest with me, and some of the questions I asked I probably shouldn't have, because now the mental image is stuck in there. But honestly, it was there anyway. I just now have confirmation. First, I asked for dates, or at the very least, approximate dates. I didn't tell her about the engagement concern I had because I didn't want her to change stories, and then remembered exactly when they occurred. Fortunately, this happened a little earlier in our relationship than she told me initially, and so we were not engaged when this happened. I can't tell you what a relief that was because I became physically ill when I had thought about that previously. Second, I asked how many times. She went overboard with this because instead of just telling me how many different dates, she decided to tell me how many times they actually hooked up. She wasn't doing it to be mean. She honestly thought this is what I wanted to know. This part of the conversation did not help me at all and in fact almost broke me down. In truth, it wasn't that often and in fact there were really only three different days it happened on, but there were several times during those three days. Then came the hard part. Why did she do it? Okay, again, I'm not the most manly of men, and I'm ashamed to admit this, but I couldn't get this out without starting to cry. I asked, why wasn't I good enough? Why him? Why didn't she just leave me? It was her turn to hold me, because at this point, everything came rushing at me. Her telling me, me having to watch them laugh with each other, her now telling me how many times they did this and where it happened. She talked during this, but to this moment, I have no idea what she said. I was too upset and honestly, nothing she was going to say was going to make a bit of difference anyway. But after I composed myself, I simply told her that the betrayal was horrible, but honestly, her response to me when I found out was just as bad, if not worse. She agreed with me, and she apologized for calling me immature. She said that she honestly believed that it wouldn't matter to me now because we were married. When she said this, my blood started to boil again. I started to say something about it, but she jumped in and said that after talking with her parents, she now sees that this was very wrong of her and that cheating is still cheating. But she still feels that our happiness we've shared since being married should count for something. I then replied that I kind of felt like that happiness was built on a lie. This led to another breakdown on her part and almost another ER visit. But with meds and having her breathe into a paper bag, we got her to calm down. I let her sleep for the rest of the night, feeling like emotionally we were both tired but come Sunday, we were talking again. By this time, I wasn't as sympathetic as I had been when I got home from the ER. I told her that I thought her introducing him to me was crappy. Me having to watch her dance with him was extra crappy, and the fact that she only told me because she was going to get caught was an elite level of crappy. Which then I demanded to know why did she think I would find out, and how many of these people at the wedding knew besides me? Well, obviously the guy knew, but then his best friend in the world also knew. Did I mention that jerk is now my brother-in-law? Which then led to her sister finding out, and she was afraid her sister was going to be the one to tell me. I asked how often she sees this guy, and she said that the wedding is the first time she's seen him in three years. Then I lost it, and asked her if they hooked up during any of the lead-up to the wedding. She got all upset about it, acting like of course that wouldn't happen because she's married now, and I just lost it and had to leave for a while, because once again, I felt like she was living on married planet, and the world there is a different place than for the rest of us. I finally cooled off enough to come home and try to be civil about things. She finally asked me what she could do to help me get past all of this, which may not sound like much, but it was the first time she offered to help me, really, so it was at least a nice gesture. I told her I wasn't sure what she could do, or if there was anything either of us could do, and that I may never get over this. She said that she wanted to help because she didn't want to see me in pain, and that over the years, she hopes I'll be able to judge her based on who she is now. She would do anything I wanted to work this out. She also wanted to be sure that I knew that she has been 100% faithful since we've been married and would never cheat on her vows. I sarcastically thanked her, which I admit wasn't the most mature thing to do. I then asked for a moratorium from further talks until at least Wednesday. I have two projects I have to get done, and honestly, I'm just exhausted. And no, I have no clue what I want to do. I shift between periods of red-hot anger where I want to kick her out and then periods of deep emotional turmoil where I want to just forget this and move on with her. Second update. 
As you know, I asked to just drop it until last night so I could focus on my job. She kept her word about it, but I could tell she was very emotional and nervous. She's taking some strong meds for her anxiety, but even as strong as it is, I can still see that she's been very anxious. I wasn't intentionally trying to punish her. In fact, quite the opposite. I really was trying to give her a break as much as me. But she told me last night that not holding her or showing her any real affection, it's really been horrible for her. Well, last night finally arrived and we had what my dad always called a come to Jesus meeting. I got home from work and I brought dinner so there would be no distractions or cleanup or anything. We started talking around 6 and finally ended around 2-ish. In that time frame, we laid out a lot of issues that have been present and what or if we are both willing to do to move forward. Long story short, starting today, I'm going to be living with my brother for a while. She's understandably upset by all of this and I'm making an effort to communicate openly with her so she doesn't feel abandoned or neglected. If you're wondering how we got from talking to me living with my brother, here's what happened in a nutshell. I know this is not going to make several of you very happy, but here's where I'm going with this. I want to save my marriage, but I can't do it living what I feel was somewhat a lie. I know she never intended to lie once we were married, but when I sat down and thought about this one question, would I have stayed with her if I had known at the time she did this? Each and every time, I answered no. So to me, she took away my ability to choose whether or not I wanted to continue and we built the next few years based on the foundation of something that wasn't quite true. However, the truth is, we still built something. Sometimes foundations can be repaired and sometimes you have to tear them down to build new ones. This is what I'm hoping to do. I'm hoping to shake things up enough for both of us so that we can start over. Like I said in the very first post, our marriage until this point had been what I would consider to be perfect or as perfect as any one thing can be. But there were some very troubling things that occurred due to this and here's a brief synopsis of our talk. I laid out the fact that while I absolutely was upset about the cheating and yes, I still consider it cheating, which she has now come to realize that this is the way it is and is going to be considered, I was equally upset by her lack of consideration for my feelings on this. I told her that I resented being told I was immature and childish for something that objectively speaking, I had every right to be upset about. Her response was to apologize and tell me she was in the wrong and that while she admits fault and sees what I'm saying, that at the same time, she had convinced herself that because we weren't married yet, I was wrong to be upset about something that had happened before this, but she now sees where she was in the wrong. I then told her that I felt very disrespected by her associating with this guy right in front of me, and that I felt humiliated having to shake his hand. Her response was to once again apologize, and she said that in her mind, at the time, she felt like she was trying to show me that there was nothing there. She said she felt like if she avoided him or acted shady around him, that I would be more upset. I told her she was wrong. She said that out of all the things, this is the one that's upset her the most, because even her sister has told her how wrong it was of her to do this to me, and she was deeply hurt by this because it had hurt me, which is what she never wanted to do. I then talked about the lack of remorse over being with someone else while we were together. Her only response was to say that she was very sorry, how at the time she had just used very poor judgment and if she could go back and change the past, she would. Then came the talk that got the most discussion, how I felt like she really wasn't sorry for anything, but that she's just sorry that I didn't just shrug my shoulders and say that everything was going to be okay, that there were going to be repercussions for what I considered to be an act of betrayal and then an act of not caring about me. I'll give her full credit here. She was brutally honest about this, and at least she was, so we didn't have to spend hours trying to work our way around it. She admitted that when we got home after the event, she started to realize that I wasn't going to let this go, and then as time went on, she knew how this was an issue. Her first instinct was to be mad at me for being mad at her, but then realized, even from her own point of view, how stupid that was. But again, she had it in her head that she was my wife, and I should easily forgive and forget something that happened way before we were married. She also admitted that when it became real, she frankly outright panicked thinking about losing her marriage. Nobody on either side of her family is divorced, so she would be the first, and she admitted to that being a big factor in her panic attack. But as the week has progressed and she's spoken more to her family, she's seen that what she has put in her mind about marriage isn't the end-all be-all she thought it was. She also did really feel bad about bringing the guy around me. However, you will notice, which I did too, that she never said she felt guilty about being with him. Now I also want you all to know this. What I've given you above is a brief synopsis. She sounds like a robot in this version, and believe me, she was not. There were lots of tears, real tears. There was arguing, pleading, and begging. As I said, this went on for eight hours, so by the time we were done, she was physically exhausted. 
I've set out the following steps if we are to reconcile, and it's totally up to her if she wants to stay together. She's very, very adamant about staying together, by the way. I don't care how illogical it seems. She is to never have contact with him again. This is an absolute for me and a deal breaker, and I was absolutely clear on this. We have to have couples therapy. While I'm living with my brother, we are still legally married, and this is not an invitation or excuse for either of us to see anyone else. Again, deal breaker in a second if either of us uses this as an excuse. Believe me, I will not, and I don't believe she will either. We start over to a point. I have to view her differently now. Even if I didn't want to, I can't just forget that she chose to cheat. So that's where we are now. I know this is not the update that some of you wanted to hear, but ultimately I have to go with what I believe will make me the happiest in the long run. My head says be aware, and I'm going to guard my heart for a long time, but my heart is still in love with her. We're going out on a date on Friday night, which she's really looking forward to. I have no idea how long I'll be with my brother. Heck, I may not even make it past Friday, but if nothing else, I feel like I have some control here, which I felt prior to this talk that I had almost none. In the end, I held her for a long time and we went to sleep. I do not want a broken woman. Right now, that's what she is. I want her to be my partner for life, but I do want her to know that to be a partner, she has to equally care about my feelings as I do hers. P.S. I had to do some real hard thinking about my new brother-in-law. Again, I've only met him a few times and he seems like a nice enough guy, but at the end of it all, he certainly was aware of the issue. But just to keep peace in the family, I'm going to not make a stink about him because that will certainly make every holiday tough going forward. As long as he never mentions the incident or the guy ever again, then I can live with it. Also, it's not going to make anyone happy, but the truth is she knew perfectly well that what she did was cheating. She has never denied that. However, what she did do was think that being married was like crossing the finish line and that basically she got by with it. She hid it because she knew that it would be over if I had found out. Final update. I've been staying with my brother for a little over a month. I cannot say enough nice words about him. He's bent over backwards to help me and I've come to appreciate him in a whole new way. Growing up we were close, but never really close if you know what I mean. This has shown me that our bond is much stronger than I ever imagined it was. The big news is that I just delivered her with divorce papers. Now before those of you who wanted me to dump her jump for joy, let me explain something. I went to a divorce lawyer and explained everything, including the fact that I did not want to go through with the divorce, but wanted everything in place just in case. He drew up a divorce decree and made three copies. One he kept on file, one for her, and one for me. I decided to take the paperwork to her myself because I knew she would be upset and I wanted to explain to her what was happening. I gave her the paperwork in a manila envelope and explained what it was for before she opened it. I also made very clear to her that I was not going to do anything with it unless we both failed to meet the conditions we had agreed upon. I explained that I was committed to us, but I really needed to see that we were headed in the right direction and that this was only there as a standby in case she didn't think I was serious. Well, this did not go over well as I had hoped for, and in retrospect, this was my mistake. She had been doing everything in her power prior to that to live up to the agreement. We had been out on several dates prior to this that were great for both of us. In other words, my timing sucked. My intention was good, but it did make it look like I was not acknowledging the steps she was taking to make this work. This led to another giant anxiety attack that we could not get under control with her meds, so off to the ER we went again. This time they gave her a shot and sent her home, and we both agreed that we would just keep her family out of it this time. I stayed with her for two days just to make sure she was okay. This of course came up in our counseling session, and well, let's just say that I came across looking like a manipulative jerk, which again in retrospect I was. I ended up taking my copy and her copy and tearing it up in front of her. She doesn't know that there's a third copy, but I plan on having him discard that as well. So now I pretty much feel like a monster because the look on her face when she got the divorce papers was something I never want to see again. She was so happy to see me that day and then I gave her that and then instant combination of sadness and terror. Other than that bump in the road, things have actually been going very well. Well enough in fact that I'm moving back home this weekend. My brother has been great, but I'm cramping his style, no matter what he says. It's been fun playing Xbox every night though, I won't deny that. But mostly I'm going home because she has done everything I asked her to do, and I've put her through a lot. I think she's paid a steep enough price, and I know she knows how serious this was. Also, in case I didn't mention this before, I do love her. She made a very stupid, selfish mistake, but it was years ago, and she had been almost the perfect wife up until that discovery. So I'm sorry to disappoint many of you, and I'm sure I will once again get many messages calling me names and calling me an embarrassment, but I don't live your lives and you don't live mine. So this should be it. There, hopefully nothing else to update going forward. 
We're not cured or healed by any means of the imagination, but we're on our way, and it's just going to take time, patience, and understanding. Karen stole my Walmart order today. So, since we don't like shopping, we've been enjoying the online ordering option at Walmart. What's not to like? You pick what you want, pay for it, they pick it and bag it, and you just roll in and pick it up. Today, however, this didn't go as smoothly as it has in the previous few years of using the service. As I said, I put in the order and selected a pickup time. Wife and I roll in and park in space number 4, then I inform them that I'm in a blue vehicle in space number 4 with the app. Other cars were already there. Other cars roll in after we get there, and the wife and I are just chatting along with the news of the day and what the grandkids have gotten up to lately. Finally, someone knocks on our window and asks what the name is on the order. I say it's our last name. The associate frowns and says, I'll be right back. Thinking that this wasn't all that unusual, wife and I go back to chatting. About a minute later, a manager comes out to us and asks us if we are sure of the order name. I pull out my phone and show them the app. However, the app is showing us that the order was already picked up. Turns out that the silver SUV in space number three was approached by the Walmart staff, asked if they were my last name, picking up their order, and the woman just waved towards the back and said, Load it up, please. Walmart staff apologized and said they're going to repick the order as a priority and they'd be out as soon as possible. 30 minutes later, a certain silver SUV pulls back into the spot and the woman slips into Karen mode and starts demanding a manager. Manager comes out and they chat for a bit. Being the nosy people we are, we listened in. She's upset that they totally messed up her order. Manager says that she was asked if her name was my last name and she just waved for them to load the stuff. They assumed that they were us, an honest mistake on the part of the Walmart staff given the information they were given. Karen is now demanding that they give her her correct order. There are, however, two problems with this. First of all, since they didn't pick up as themselves, the order was returned to stock. And two, Karen didn't bring the incorrect stuff back. Arguments go back and forth for a bit, and while this is going on, they bring out our hastily repicked groceries and a $50 gift card by way of apology. Thus restocked, we decided to drive away, and we never found out what the final Karen versus management outcome was. Plot twist! What if they had the same last name? I've always said that your order number should have a license plate too. That way they can verify it's the right car they're putting the stuff into. How I got a car dealership to give my friend a newer car. Circa 2020 January, my friend makes a stupid decision and buys a brand new car that he can't afford. His insurance is like $400 a month. He makes like $10.25 an hour working as a shift supervisor at McDonald's. His car payment is like $795 a month. Now at $10.25 an hour, 30 hours a week, that's a weekly income of about $300 a week, or about $1,230 a month. So, yeah. So my friend came to me for help because I used to sell cars and I know the industry pretty well. I go over his paperwork. The dealer did rip him off, but my friend is trying to find a way to get out of this mess, and ripping someone off isn't illegal. They did, of course, overcharge him for warranty. They gave him a higher APR. They had add-ons, etc., but none of that is illegal, and I know the only way I can get my friend out of this deal is if they did something illegal. So I look at his finance application that my friend signed. It correctly listed his income, which turned on a light bulb in my head. No bank is going to approve someone for a $795 car payment if they're only making $1,200 a month. It does not make mathematical sense to do that. So I start searching through his paperwork for the finance app the dealer submitted to the bank. Oftentimes, when you submit a finance application at a dealership, the dealership will take the hand-filled out application and reproduce it electronically. This is pretty normal. However, on the application the dealer submitted to the bank, the dealer said my friend was a GM of the McDonald's and made $70,000 a year. My friend had good credit, so it doesn't appear like the bank asked for proof of income. So I go to the dealership with my friend and tell the sales manager he's going to want to put me in touch with the GM because we're going to be unwinding my friend's deal and giving his trade-in back. The sales manager thought I was joking. The GM also thought I was joking. Then I demonstrated how his dealership finance department committed bank fraud. I showed the GM the finance app my friend filled out. I then showed the GM the finance app his dealership submitted to the bank and pointed at the income difference. My friend really made $14,000 a year. The dealership claimed my friend made $70,000 a year. That's bank fraud. That's a felony. 
Let's keep this simple, shall we? The GM sees his dealership is in a load of crap. The proof I'm presenting to him is rock solid. He knows it, I know it. We're all on the same page. He goes, Okay, so what can I do to make this right? I go, Unwind the deal and give my friend his trade-in back. Unwinding the deal is basically the GM agreeing to cancel the deal and basically erasing the deal and pretending it never happened. GM tries to avoid that, but I remain firm and remind him we can easily take this documentation and cause some serious issues for him. He knows I'm right. My friend also needs a car to get to work the next day. The GM says he'll check into it when he comes back and tells me unfortunately they sold his trade in already. I said, that's fine, unwind the deal and let's put my friend into something as good or slightly better than what he traded in for. So the GM goes, so he'll buy a car similar to his trade in? I said, no, you'll give him a car similar to his trade-in. The GM goes, it doesn't work that way. I go, it does when you commit bank fraud. GM is upset with me and I remind him, I'm being really nice and this situation can totally get really ugly. Like felony level charges ugly. Like losing your franchise ugly. So yeah, this is going to hurt. But it's going to hurt less my way. So the GM says alright and he looks in his inventory and he tells me they have a 2007 Focus with 10,000 more miles. I tell him, no, the car you give my friend needs to be the same or better than what he traded in. The GM counters, I'm giving him a free car. And I go, no, you took his trade in, you sold it, you made money on that sale. You also committed a felony in the process of selling him his new car. You are now correcting that mistake. This isn't a free car for my friend, this is a, you are correcting your mistake. GM insists that's what he's willing to do. I tell him if he can't do better, then we will go to a consumer protection attorney and have a conversation with them. My friend didn't want to go this route, but it was our plan B. We go to get up and the GM says, Wait, give me a second. The GM goes, I have an 08 Civic. It has 5,000 more miles, but it's a Civic and not a Focus. I unwind the deal on the new car and put your friend in the Civic at no extra cost. We agree. GM has the paper drawn up. The old loan on the new car is cancelled. They take in the new car again. But because it's already titled, they'll have to sell it as used. That sucks for them. And they gave my friend a better car than the one he traded in. For people asking why we didn't get a lawyer involved from the start, we could have done that, but courts take a long time and this was a faster way to fix the situation. Never buy a new car. If you really want something newish, Get something that's a few years old with low mileage that you'll pay half the cost for. Am I the jerk for going to my best friend's wedding instead of my wife's birthday party? My wife is turning 30 and has planned a big birthday party with her friends and family. Unfortunately, my best friend has also got his wedding on the same day. I've picked my best friend's wedding as we're really close and I don't get along well with my wife's family. My wife is now furious with me and demanding that I do not go to the wedding, but I can't go back on the commitment I made to my best friend. So, am I the jerk for going to the wedding anyway? Extra info. The birthday has been planned for a few months now. Invites have been sent and the venue has been booked. I got the wedding invite this week. I guess if you want to be divorced, it's fine to go to the wedding. Especially when wife's birthday party was fixed weeks ago. OP got the invite to the friend's wedding only this week. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. Simply because you accepted an invite that you received a week ago while she's been planning this for months. Usually I'd say the wedding is more important, but you already have a commitment for that day and decided it wouldn't be as fun for you and that's messed up. The only compromise I can think of is attend the wedding and skip the reception for the party. How important of a friend can you be if you get the invitation only a few days in advance? And if that guy really would be your best friend, he'd know your wife's birthday is that same time, so you might have other plans, especially as it's a zeroing birthday. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. I can't go back on the commitment I made to my best friend. You've known about your wife's party for months. You were going. Why is it okay to renege on that commitment? And if you're really that close to your friend, why are you only just finding out the date of the wedding now? You're the jerk. Your partner's longer term planning wins out, sorry to say. She can't have known your best friend was going to throw his wedding that same day and you have to know this is a make or break kind of thing. Your wife is unlikely to forgive this easily. Not the jerk. Wow, as a married woman of 8 years, I can assure you that if my hubby's best friend had a wedding on the day of my birthday party, I would encourage my husband to go to it. 
you get a birthday party once a year. The wedding should definitely take priority over her birthday party. I can't even say that I'm surprised everyone here is calling you the jerk. If the roles were flipped, they would all be calling husband a man-child for making such a big deal over his birthday party. They'd be calling him controlling for not letting you go to this wedding and telling you to divorce him. But of course, because it's the wife acting this way, everyone here is making excuses for her as usual. So glad I met my husband back in 2010 before people lost the last bit of common sense they had left. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Unpopular opinion, but if you can't stand to be around your in-laws, you don't have to be around them. You can choose to suffer being around them to please your significant other, but you don't have to. Am I the jerk for not caring that my coworker is allergic to dogs? I work in a warehouse with about 26 other people. Been there for five years now. I have a Japanese Akita. These dogs shed a lot. One of my new coworkers is allergic to dogs. This has caused an issue. When they use the break room, they start sneezing a lot. I have pictures of my dog at my workstation, so they know that I have him. It's not a secret or anything. They went to the boss and said that they needed to be accommodated because of their medical condition. He came to me and asked if I could please do anything. So I started keeping a clean set of coveralls in my locker and I put them on as soon as I get to work. Apparently, this was not good enough. So I started just staying out of the break room. Nope. If they came into my zone, they started sneezing. They told my boss that I should be forced to get rid of my dog because it was affecting their work. The thing is, I know that I'm not the only one with a dog. At least three of the guys I work with have dogs. I told my boss that I will never consider rehoming my dog and they can just take some Benadryl or something. Now they're crying that they might have to quit because they can't work here. I just don't care, but they certainly do. They're saying that I'm a jerk for prioritizing my dog over their livelihood. Edit. My boss got me the extra coveralls and arranged for the extra washing as an accommodation. I volunteered to stay out of the break room. Take the dog's pictures down. Say he's gone now. Keep your dog. Your job should never be in a position to ask you to change your home life. What you do off the clock, who or what you have in your house is your own business, so long as it does not affect work performance or direct safety of others. But it's not your responsibility to cater your choice in having pets to someone with an allergy. What is this coworker going to do if they see a dog in the street, a service dog in a coffee shop? The world can't cater to them. They have to cater to their own issues, not the jerk, and take it up with HR. Also, I find it super suspect. This coworker is supposedly so allergic to dogs, they react even when OP changes into clean coveralls. Their coworker couldn't ride airplanes without having a reaction, even if there wasn't a dog on the flight. Also, if three other coworkers have dogs, then why is OP specifically getting singled out? I'm not saying the coworker is faking their allergy, but something's not adding up here. Am I the jerk for telling my friends they aren't ready for a baby? I, 26 female, recently learned that one of my best friends, who's also 26, and her husband, who's 29, are expecting a baby. I feel like a jerk since I didn't react with joy like everyone else, but I honestly can't support their decision. They've only been married for a couple of years, so there was plenty of time for them to settle down and have kids, in my opinion, but my friend has always had baby fever. I'm mainly concerned about their ability to be parents. They both work full time and when they get home, they complain that they are too tired to take care of stuff around the house, cooking, cleaning, etc. They go out to eat every night because my friend doesn't know how to cook and her husband just doesn't want to. Their house is always messy between dishes, laundry, and general filth. They also have poor money management skills, always shopping for stuff they just see and want but don't need rather than buying stuff like groceries to actually cook meals. They've struggled to pay rent a few times because of this. In addition, their house is incredibly small, overflowing with stuff and not a safe environment for a baby. It's very old and has a lot of issues. Realistically, how do you expect to take care of a baby with habits like that and in a space that isn't suited for them? When I expressed these concerns to my friends, they essentially told me that I shouldn't worry about it because nobody is ever prepared to have a baby and that I should just be happy for them. I get that you're never really prepared, but you can have a game plan, right? Start saving and making sure you have the stuff and space required. How nonchalant they were about my concerns made me even more anxious. You'd think I was the one having the baby. Yesterday the topic came up again and my friend asked me if I had changed my mind about it and when I told her no, she was graded. I also learned they're now trying to rush a move to get a bigger and better house even though she's halfway through her second trimester. She's starting to get defensive, 
saying that just because I don't really want kids of my own, that I was trying to bring her down and that I should just support her pregnancy rather than being concerned about future problems. I told her that she and her husband were too caught up in elation to see the reality that being a parent isn't just about cute baby clothes and being a friend to your kid. I did get snippy, which I shouldn't have done, but it felt like she was just brushing away what I consider valid concerns. I did eventually apologize, saying, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I don't think I'm unjustified here, which didn't go well because it wasn't a real apology. Not one she wanted to hear at least. I just can't bring myself to believe they are responsible or mature enough to have a baby, and that makes me feel like a bad friend. So, am I the jerk for telling them they're not ready to have a baby and should have waited until they get their lives together? Edit, since a lot of people are saying the same thing, I have expressed these concerns before, many times, prior to my friend actually becoming pregnant. It wasn't unsolicited. She would ask my opinion and I would tell her these things each time. Update, I was a jerk. I overstepped my boundaries and hurt people I care about. No excuses. I consider myself very fortunate that my friend answered my text message and agreed to see me. She's allowed me to go over to her house tomorrow so that I may properly apologize to her and her husband. I do not expect them to forgive and forget, but I would like to tell them I'm sorry. You're the jerk, because at this point it's too late and you need to be supportive of your friends. Like, your comments are so completely unhelpful, I don't see how you're wondering if you're the jerk. And just to be clear, you're not the jerk for thinking they're not ready to have kids, you're the jerk for saying it out loud. You're the jerk. You're not the reproductive police and they're having this baby whether you like it or not. I hope you don't expect to remain friends with these people once their baby arrives because they'll always remember how you didn't want them to have their baby. Not the jerk. Too many people do this. Raising a kid isn't easy even with all the help and money you do have. Source, me. I'm a stay-at-home mom and my husband makes incredible money. It's still not easy. It's still a ton of work and a lot of money. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her friend? Please let us know. I hope OP's ready to start babysitting for them and lending them money. I kicked out my daughter because she hasn't found a job since moving in with me. My daughter, Amy, who's 24, female, graduated university a couple of years ago and has had several part-time jobs since then. She would work for a few months, quit, and look for another job which has better pay. At the end of last year, she asked if she could move in with us, both in our 40s so she could save money and look for a job in the field she graduated in. That sounded good to us, so we agreed. We did not expect any kind of rent or money from her at the time, simply that she would just find a job. However, it's almost August and she has still not found a job yet. We asked about her job hunt and she said that she was still looking and has not had any offers post-interview. I feel tricked and lied to because surely she would have found a job by now. It's been months. She's also never mentioned going to any interviews and it felt like she was lying to keep living here. Her field is one that's looking for more women to join the workforce. She has been living here for months to essentially do nothing. So I talked with my husband, and we both agreed it would be best for her to live with her aunt, my husband's sister, as she works in the same industry as the one my daughter graduated in. Maybe she could learn some things that will help her get a job quicker. We then told Amy that she needed to move out to her aunt's while she looks for a job, because it's clear she isn't doing enough here and her aunt could help. She was upset, immediately asked if she contributed to some of the bills, could she stay here? But we said no, and it was time for her to get more serious about applying for jobs. She said nothing and packed her bags and left. We tried calling her today to ask how her aunt's house is, she lives an hour's drive away, and did not answer us. Instead, she sent us a spreadsheet and tracker of sorts, which detailed job roles, application links, dates, and stages of applications where multiple said interview. I immediately felt guilty and tried to call her again. She will not pick up and her aunt sent my husband a text asking us to respect Amy's privacy while she stays with her. Were we the jerks here? We tried doing what was best. You're the jerk. You both made a lot of assumptions about her job search and kicked her out without even asking about the actual job search. Unfortunately, if she hasn't found full-time work two years after graduating, despite a regular search, there is a critical issue. Am I the jerk for pre-gaming my wife's dinners? My wife and I are both 32. Since we got married and moved in together five months ago, my wife has simply not made nearly enough food for me. This is not a kind of situation where I'm constantly agitated at her for incompetence or anything like that. I would be more than happy to microwave a burrito. I would be more than happy to whip up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But I can't. My wife has, every single night of our marriage, 
done the same thing. She'll make me a tiny dinner. I'm talking like a Chinese chicken salad with 30 grams of chicken and 10 leaves of lettuce arranged fashionably with dressing. When I finish eating, I'm still hungry because for a 230-pound man who works a physical labor job, it's not enough food. At first, I tried to openly communicate with her, but she always took it horribly. She would adopt a thousand-yard stare and then begin talking about how incompetent she is and how she can't even make her husband a proper dinner. I'd try to calm her down with, Oh, honey, that's not the case. I just eat too much. Or, Don't worry about it. I can make a bit more. I'd try to be overwhelmingly positive. It never helped. She would always just get incredibly disappointed in herself, cry, and or take it out on me. Then she would make the exact same amount the following day. After the communication route failed, I tried to eat her dinners as is. It became hard to sleep at night due to hunger and I lost 7 pounds in the first month. Eventually, I figured out my own system. On my way home from work, I started swinging by a fast food restaurant and getting myself a burger. I would basically pre-game her meals with some more calories. I figured it was win-win as what she doesn't know can't hurt her and I could have my fill of food. I would eat on my way home, walk in the door, pick at the salad or quinoa or homemade mac and cheese she made, compliment her for her delicious cooking, and later dispose of the wrappers discreetly. Two days ago, I was on my way home and in line at a drive through My mother-in-law was coming out of the restaurant. She ran over and greeted me. I asked her in a humorous way not to tell her daughter where she saw me because she had taken it badly and she agreed. But then she told on me anyway. I got home to a furious wife who demanded details. When I provided the truth, she got extremely angry and looked legitimately hurt. I'm not good at handling confrontation and feel like I betrayed my wife in some way. Was I in the wrong here? It's a little concerning that she goes full passive aggressive when you say something to her. It sounds like she has a really hard time when her carefully crafted mental image of herself is even slightly challenged. Not the jerk. He already told us he spoke with her and she gets the thousand yard stare. Then she's there crying and carrying on. Then her saying she will do better and the next night she makes the exact same amount of food. She isn't listening or it's some kind of control tactic on her part. Not the jerk. Just cook your own food. If she makes a fuss, just communicate that she's simply not making enough food and despite telling her repeatedly, she refuses to increase the amount. Although from her reactions, she might be trying to get you to lose weight. Wife thinks OP is at an unhealthy weight and has him on a diet. Quinoa and lettuce for dinner says, lose some weight, bubba. Wife is trying to get him to lose weight without telling him that he's overweight. Would I be the jerk for not having my cancer-stricken ex-husband stay with me through his treatment? For most of our marriage, my husband, 39 male, and I, 37 female, had a very happy relationship. We had good jobs, decent money, two kids, and we loved each other. Then he got diagnosed with a rare form of cancer and we went through years of painful treatments and recovery together. We moved to a small house to be close to the research center where he underwent treatment. His parents paid half of the down payment on the house. The other half was from our savings and investments. In the divorce, he gave me the house and took all of his medical debt. We've been divorced a year, but now his cancer has come back and he needs treatment again at the same research hospital. He wants to stay in what is now my house while undergoing treatment and his parents expect me to house him and look after him because he was generous in letting me have the house without taking his rightful share. When we were married and he was undergoing treatment, it was new stuff that was expensive and also very physically draining on him. We were lucky that both our jobs were supportive and flexible, but with his health issues, kids and expenses, we had to downgrade our lifestyle a lot. That, plus the physical changes in his body, made him very depressed. Whenever he felt a bit better, he'd go stay in his hometown. It's a small town where most of his family and a lot of his childhood friends live. I was doing all the caretaking of him while also dealing with insurance complications. I was also managing the kids, the entire household, and my full-time job. We had help from friends and neighbors, but it was very hard. I wasn't happy about him spending his healthy days away from us, but it was good for his mental health, so I didn't feel like I could object. While he was staying there, he had reconnected with his high school girlfriend. A couple years ago, he admitted to me that he was hooking up with her and I filed for divorce. He had fully recovered from his cancer by then. There are other aspects around the cheating that left me very heartbroken and feeling betrayed. His giving me the house and taking all the debt was an apology of a sort. His parents feel that I owe him for getting the house and should let him stay there for the two to three months for his treatment at the facility. I do want him to be well and I don't want my kids to lose a loving father. But I can't deal with having him around me 
especially not if I end up being his nurse and caretaker again. I'm still very bitter about how our marriage ended. A lot of people close to me are telling me that I should support him for the sake of my kids. Would I be the jerk if I said I can't do that? Edit. They announced their engagement the day the divorce was finalized. That still hurts so much. I'm really struggling with this. I don't think that I hate him. A part of me still loves him as an old friend. I definitely wouldn't want my kids to suffer losing their father. He loves them and is loved by them. Update. The Sunday after I made this post, my ex-in-laws picked up the kids for a zoo trip. They sometimes come to pick them up to entertain them and so I thought nothing of it. A few hours later, a very teary and contrite mother-in-law dropped off two bawling kids with me. She told them their dad is sick and won't make it if he doesn't stay with us and go to the hospital. We hadn't had a talk with the kids yet about the diagnosis and she just completely dropped it on them. I was so furious, I was raging. I called the ex and tore him a new one. He was shocked too and we together went off on his mom. She broke down and cried, begging me to not take away her grandkids from her as if I'd trust her after this. X and I together talked to the kids, him on video, and assured them that yes, he is sick, but he'll be fine. He just needs to go to the hospital and they'll make him better like last time he was sick. The kids settled after that, but my oldest has been at me crying and begging to make dad come live with us. I promised them I'd talk to dad and figure out what's the best thing to do. I swallowed a lot of pride to talk to him about why he was doing this. We had a pretty long and detailed discussion. The bottom line is that he's broke. He still has a decent job, but his credit is ruined. He has a lot of debt, and he stupidly got the cheapest insurance that barely covers anything. Fiance is no help either. She's worse off financially. So he needs a place to stay. He can't afford this otherwise. His parents are funding some of his medical payments and are already stretched. He was finally alright when we broke up, so I have no idea what happened in such a short time. Anyway, X and his girlfriend moved into my daughter's room. My daughter happily gave up her room to her dad and is now sharing her little brother's room. Both kids are over the moon happy to have their dad in their home. My daughter keeps checking on him every few minutes to make sure he's still okay. Mother-in-law really scared her. I'll never forgive that woman for this. I let the girlfriend move in with him because I was too angry to care about who came to look after him as long as it wasn't me. I didn't know how I could bear having her in my home, but it appears to be more misery for her than me and that strangely makes it more tolerable for me. She is teary-eyed and crying all the time. It's only been three days, but I'm so annoyed I want to shake her and tell her to pull it together. The current treatment plan is for three months. I'm counting down the days. I'm thankful to the many people who gave me great advice on my last post. I wasn't expecting things to go this way. I'll slowly pull myself and the kids away and move, but for now, I have to deal with this for my kids' sake. Final update. My ex and his fiance moved out today. His treatment went very well this time around. He had to deal with general weakness and nausea, but no throwing up like previous time. It's amazing how much medicine improves and changes. He'll need monthly shots for a while, and I agreed to house him for a weekend next month, but after that, he's on his own. The stay went well. We had no drama really. I kept myself busy, and the kids and I traveled a lot. They both managed the rest of the stuff alright, and things worked out. My kids are happy and back to their normal stuff. I had a talk with my daughter about how grandma exaggerated things to get her way and how it's not okay and she understood. She has shown no interest in visiting her grandparents and I'm happy about that. The last week of his stay, his fiance went back to their town to take care of some stuff since he was doing pretty well on his own. He and I had a few long detailed conversations. They were cathartic in some ways and saddening and maddening in others. I think I got some closure. At least I'm not feeling the bitterness the way I used to. On another positive note, all that dressing up and going out I've been doing has worked out for me. I met someone. We've been on two dates and it's going great so far. This is my first time dating since the divorce, so I'm keeping my expectations muted. But still, it's very fun and exciting. I hate my engagement ring and my husband doesn't know. I, 25 female, and my husband, 24 male, have been together for over three years. We got engaged last winter and have been married now for six months. I hate the ring. He wanted a traditional engagement, pick the ring himself, talk to my family first, one knee, etc. I showed him many photos of rings I liked. We even shopped together and picked a few we both loved. He ended up proposing with a ring that looks nothing like anything we'd picked together. He told me later he showed his mom photos of what I liked and in short, she disagreed. She didn't like that we had picked lab-created stones. She also told him the shapes I liked were dated. She pushed him for real diamonds, which blew his budget 
So my husband picked a tiny diamond pair, halo with stones around the band, similar to his mom's, just smaller. I hate it. I struggle with sensory issues and the side stones pinch my fingers. I think about it all day, every day. I sometimes have to take it off while driving because it hurts to hold anything. I've worn the ring out of loyalty from my husband since he proposed. I bought my own wedding band and the e-ring is little enough I can hide it in a stack of other things. I feel like a brat for hating it. It was far too expensive to be as ugly and poorly crafted as it is. I have to have it serviced almost monthly because the prongs on the side bend and stack my clothing. The jeweler I consult with has told me this can't be fixed due to the size. He's warned me that I will lose stones, likely most of them on the band if a single prong breaks. It's a constant reminder my husband picked his mom's taste over mine for a symbol of our commitment. I would rather have green fingers from something meaningful than this crap. Update. A few days ago I stopped wearing my ring. After the last repair, it's in my jewelry box. I've been wearing my wedding band in a stack by itself for now. My husband noticed and complimented my wedding band when I was driving on a short road trip together over the weekend. I explained that my engagement ring pinches bad while I drive and I decided I would only wear it on special occasions to protect the stones. He's been aware of all of the repairs. He then laughed a bit and told me, you could just not wear it at all. Keep it for sentimental value. I was a bit taken back, so I asked him if he had purchased insurance for it like we had discussed after we got engaged. He apologized for telling me he would, but he decided it wasn't worth it to him a long time ago. He was waiting for the ring to wear out or me to stop wearing it because he's wanted to replace it since he bought it and he wants to upgrade that bad boy as often as he can. In all of my avoidance to protect his feelings, it didn't occur to me that he didn't like the ring either. As I suspected, he honestly thought his mom's taste would be better. The conversations compounded and it made him second guess himself. After he confessed he didn't like it, I confessed the style isn't mine and it made me think of his mom. We laughed together. He expressed he's already been saving for something special for a while, but told me to pick myself out something silver I can wear comfortably in the meantime. I'd marry him again with a twist tie. I wish I wouldn't have danced around the fear of hurting his feelings for so long. Live and learn. Am I the jerk for baking for my kids? Me, 37 female, and my ex-husband, 39 male, were married for 12 years and got a divorce because, surprise, not to me, I was never straight all along. We have two kids together who are 9 and 8. My ex got remarried two years ago and for the last six months, the arrangement has been our kids stay with their dad every other weekend. His wife has three kids from another marriage who are all 12 and up and they don't have a super consistent custody arrangement, so I never know when they'll be with their mom. I'm a big time hobby baker. I even made my ex's wedding cake when he got remarried and it brings me so much joy to cook and bake for the people I love. My kids affectionately call my creations Mommy Bakes. Since my kids started spending consistent time at their dad's, I've been sending them off with enough Mommy Bakes for the two of them to share for the weekend. Recently, I noticed when I unpack their bags, the goodies are untouched. I asked them about it, and the first couple times, they said they just weren't hungry or that their stepmom had made them something instead. This last weekend, they came home with the goodies still packaged and a note that said, bring enough to share. I texted their stepmom about it, and she sent me a lengthy text about how her kids don't think it's very fair that my kids get special treatment, and that going forward, she'll start throwing the treats away instead of politely sending them home untouched. I haven't responded because I'm not quite sure what to say. I never thought providing food for my kids for the weekend would cause a problem. So, am I the jerk? Edit. Since a lot of people are hung up on the quantity, I explained in a comment that the rest of what I make is put in their school lunches for the week. Edit 2. Thank you everyone for your input. Even the more harsh ones really helped put things into perspective. My kids' health, joy, and well-being will always come first, and I've put that in jeopardy by not being more flexible and accepting of our reality. I'm not going to send any more treats unless it's a special event, and in that case, I'll send a whole batch over to the house. Not the jerk. You are under no obligation to provide baked goods for her kids, especially since they didn't talk to you about it like grown-ups. However, in the name of family peace, it might be wise to start sending them with a large enough dessert to share if you want to continue sending food. It sounds like the situation as it stands is awkward and uncomfortable for your kids, and they're the ones who matter here. Insane Karen parks in front of a train. This isn't my story. My dad is friends with a train engineer and he would always be super nice to me and my family. And he told us this insane, crazy story. Info you will need to know. So this story is about a train engineer. And as everyone knows, trains can't stop on a dime. 
But the important info you will need to know is about wheel slips. Sometimes trains can have a failed start or stop and slide across the track because the wheels lose traction. If a train goes into a wheel slip while stopping, it's extremely difficult to stop. Wheel slips are usually caused by weight distribution or not being able to gain traction. If a train has too much weight, it can go into a wheel slip easily. So the people who load the train need to make sure that it's just the right amount of weight distribution. On to the story. So let's call my dad's friend, Tom. Tom was on his normal route and in the conductor's seat is someone we will call Bill. Tom was going around 70 miles per hour and was about to come up on a crossing. In the distance, you could see a car on the crossing. He thought that the arms hadn't gone down yet and cars were still crossing as it was still a ways away. As it got closer, he noticed a car was parked on the crossing and a woman and her kid were standing right beside it on the tracks holding up a sign that Tom couldn't read, but he immediately knew this was bad. He slammed on the emergency brakes and blew the horn as loud as he could to try and warn the woman. As it got closer and closer, she wouldn't budge, but then the train went into an unexpected wheel slip. I'll explain why after. And now they were sliding at a high velocity and heading straight towards the mom and presumably her son. Bill and Tom were panicking, letting trains nearby know what was going on. People who saw the occasion were yelling at the woman and her kid, and as they were approaching her, people realized she wasn't going to budge due to what her sign stated. People ran and came and pushed her out of the way. Then a few moments later, Tom and Bill slammed into the car, and since they were in a wheel slip, they couldn't slow down. Luckily, after a bit, Bill and Tom managed to gain traction again and stopped two and a half miles later. Bill and Tom were really scared about what had happened, and despite their protocol, they jumped out of the engine and ran to see if her and her kid were okay. Luckily, they knew they would be there because the police would need to ask questions. After apparently, according to Tom, what seemed like forever, they finally made it back to the crossing. They found the mom and her kid, and she wasn't there because she was stuck. She was protesting. The entitled mom proceeded to have a conversation like this. Finally, now... I want you to meet my son. He wants a ride in your train. Tom. What? Entitled Kid. I want to be a train driver. Can I go pull the horn? Tom. Sorry, kid. No, we can't allow that. Let him do it. He's just curious. Besides, you owe us one since you attempted to hurt us. Tom. Why's that? Before Entitled Mom could proceed to yell at Tom, Bill found the sign and told Tom to read what it said. The sign stated, Stop crashing into cars because you're too lazy to stop and enjoy the fun of demolition. Embrace the new generation. Tom, what are you trying to say? Entitled Mom. The whole thing about trains can't stop on a dime is an old wives' tale. Admit it, you don't stop because you enjoy crashing into cars. Tom, what? No, we don't stop because we can't stop. The wait, I've heard it all before and I'm tired of being lied to. Tom. Okay, well, it's not a lie. Besides, a crash like this creates a huge inconvenience for our schedule, and we have to try to work around this. We don't do it for fun. What do you mean by embrace the new generation? Karen. I've tried to stop so many trains time and time before because my boy wants to be able to blow the horn and see what the inside looks like. He wants to be a tra train driver. <laughs> he wants to be a train driver when he grows up too. You guys are so lazy, you just wave. Too selfish to let the new generation be excited to be a train driver. You guys are so selfish. Tom. Ma'am, if we could, we would. I wouldn't have minded. But you must understand that everyone is on a tight schedule. Stopping can put a lot of people in danger. Because if we aren't in a siding at a specific time, it can delay schedules and trains can accidentally be led onto the line you're on and can cause a head-on collision. Oh, shut up. You guys aren't on a tight schedule. I've been waiting here almost all day, and it took forever to see a train. We got so bored, and we needed to find things to do. You know how many people I had to tell off? I got so many questions about why I was there. I said I was just putting coins on the track. Each time someone came by, I had to look busy. We put a lot of coins on there. Oh, I need to check them and go see how they turned out. Tom's and Bill's faces grew red with anger. Tom, you did what? <laughs> you did what? Karen, me and my son put coins on the track. Is there a problem? Tom, how many? 
I lost count, we put so many on. Tom was furious because he realized why he went into the unexpected wheel slip. There were so many coins and he was traveling so fast that the train lost traction and they went into the wheel slip that put many in danger. Tom screamed and yelled at the woman and asked how she could be so stupid. Tom told the officers what had happened and she was charged for trespassing and she committed a felony by making her car get hit on purpose. So Karen had a lot of bills to pay and spent just a small time in the slammer and her entitled kid didn't get what he wanted. Everybody was okay, but man, this story when Tom told my family made us drop our jaws and I hope it did the same for you. Am I the jerk for firing my vet after the way the nurse spoke to me? I, 29 female, pay $35 per month for an insurance plan for my cat, who's two, female. This includes a basic checkup every six months. Her appointment was scheduled for today at 12 p.m. While I was waiting to check her in, it was me, one guy in front of me, and the girl at the front desk. A nurse came out from the back and told the girl at the front desk, hey, just a heads up, everybody went on their lunch break, just so you know. My cat has anxiety, so when I booked her appointment, they assured me that she'd be in and out. So I said, uh, if no one is here, should I wait to come back later to drop my cat off? The nurse shot daggers at me and said bluntly, this conversation doesn't concern you. I was kind of in shock because I didn't think I'd asked anything too crazy. I said, I'm just confused since I don't want to drop her off if she's just going to sit in a room. The nurse said, we were having a separate conversation. She'll be fine. I have pretty bad anxiety myself and wasn't here to argue, just to advocate for my cat. So I meekly said, okay, and I figured that was that. Well, this nurse gives me an up-down look, turns around and walks into the back. The door hasn't even swung shut yet, and I could hear her trashing me to her other nurses. She's laughing and saying, you guys, there's this crazy lady at the front with her cat, and then the door swung closed. This is where I might be the jerk, because I shut down and told the girl checking me in, I'm not letting my cat go back there, unless that person is not in the room or if I can go back there with my cat. If she talks to me like that, how am I supposed to trust her to give the best care for my cat, who can't speak up for herself? I also said I wanted to make a complaint. I asked for a business card for a manager. The front desk girl gave me a card and I called the number. The front desk rang. She put it on hold and looked sheepish. I asked if this was the number for the manager or for the store. She admitted it was for the store. At this point, my cat is howling in her carrier. We had driven all this way and she was so shaken up, so sunken cost fallacy. I said I'd stay for the appointment if I could come in the room with her and make sure she was safe. The front desk girl finally admitted, well, no one is here, they're at lunch, so it would be for at least an hour. So the nurse had been lying about my cat being taken care of all along. I didn't want to argue anymore, so I said I wanted to reschedule for a time I could be in the room. She booked me for next week. Afterwards, I called my mom and she told me I definitely shouldn't go back, but I also shouldn't have threatened to make a complaint to the manager and be a Karen. So I'm planning to call back this week and cancel my appointment and my insurance and take my business elsewhere. I think I was sticking up for my baby, but I could just be a crazy cat lady causing issues when I could have just left. So am I the jerk? Listen to your mom about not going back, but in addition to making a complaint, also write a review. Let other people know about their supposed business model of laughing and lying to their customers. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. The nurse said that comment knowing you would still be able to hear her, so that's a very weird bullying tactic. Then the front desk nurse gave you the wrong number purposefully to stop your complaint. Then you found out you were justified in your concerns because it would in fact be a long wait for your cat by themselves because everyone was on lunch. Completely, they're the jerks in this situation. Also, why would they have an appointment at 12 p.m. when the whole staff goes to lunch? This is so bizarre. Not the jerk. I would never go back there either. They drop the ball several times. One, agreeing to give your cat a quick appointment and not following through. Two, speaking rudely to you when you express your concerns. And three, giving you the wrong number to make a complaint. Plus, I've never heard of a store or service that lets all the workers take a break for an hour at the same time without closing. I'd switch vets for that reason alone. Like, go ahead and shut down the store for an hour, but don't book appointments during your lunch break. This is ridiculous, and I can't believe the vet spoke so rudely to your very reasonable question, and the audacity to mock you for it. They are major jerks. Finally, I have a concern about what your mom said. 
I really hate that lately anyone who complains about anything is called a Karen. You are not a Karen. A Karen is someone who complains and yells at workers over petty things out of their control, like yelling at cashiers for not accepting an expired coupon. You wanted to talk to a manager to complain about one of their workers treating a customer very rudely and then mocking them. That's completely justified. So please switch vets and don't think of yourself as a crazy cat lady. If anything, you are kinder than you should have been. Karen demands I bring her kid on our family vacation. While my husband and I are childless and we have no desire to have kids of our own, we absolutely love spending time with our nieces and nephews. Among them are my brother's 11-year-old son, Alan, my 6-year-old niece, Ava, and my sister's 10-year-old daughter, Kelly. Last May, we planned a weekend trip to a beach town about an hour away with the kids. Our purpose was twofold, to bond with them and also to assess if they were ready for longer overnight trips. It was reassuring to know that we'd be within driving distance of home in case any of them needed to return early. My husband and I anticipated that Ava, being only six, might have some difficulty staying overnight away from her parents. However, both she and Alan were well behaved throughout the trip. Unfortunately, Kelly misbehaved for the entire trip. Friday, we picked them up from their parents' houses around five and arrived at the beach town by seven. During the car ride, Kelly instigated and kept trying to start fights with Alan. At the grocery store, she wouldn't listen and refused to take turns with Alan and Ava to watch TV. Saturday, Kelly threw a fit because she wanted ice cream right away, but we had planned to go later. We offered her fruit as a snack, but she threw some of it in the trash until my husband intervened. At the beach, Kelly repeatedly filled the hole Ava was trying to dig with sand, despite us asking her to stop. She also tried to provoke fights with her cousins. During dinner, she was rude to our waitress and gave a sarcastic response when asked to apologize. Sunday, at the gift store, Kelly wanted both a conch shell and a mermaid doll, but didn't have enough pocket money for both. When we explained that she needed to choose one, she threw a fit and ended up with neither. Back at the hotel, Kelly ignored our request to help pack suitcases and kept trying to watch TV instead. During the car ride home, she continued to instigate fights with Alan and Ava. My husband and I had a serious talk with my sister about Kelly's behavior, and we decided that she wouldn't be invited on any more overnight trips with us. We've stuck to our decision and it's upset my sister, who believes that we're being unfair to a 10-year-old. I understand that Kelly's just being a kid, but there's a reason we waited until the kids were older to go on these trips. At 10 years old, she's too old to constantly misbehave and throw tantrums like she's four. My sister argues that Alan and Ava may be more mature and calm for their ages, and we shouldn't single out Kelly for not being an exception to her age. However, we believe that setting boundaries and holding her accountable for her actions is essential for her growth. My sister may be upset with our decision, but we're sticking to it because we want to encourage responsible behavior and respectful attitudes during our trips. We hope that in time, Kelly will learn and grow from this experience and perhaps she can join us in the future adventures once she demonstrates better behavior. Not the jerk. You are aunt and uncle of the year. Don't worry about your sister either. She's just upset that you're being a better parent to her kid by sticking to your word than she is capable of being. Not the jerk. They raised a brat. Now they have to deal with the consequences of that. My guess is that she still throws tantrums a lot of times at home and they placate her by giving her whatever she wants. Also, being an only child likely hasn't helped. Am I the jerk for saying my wife made us look disgraceful? In the past year, I, male 42, have been fortunate to receive a promotion to a senior position at the engineering company I work for. With this new role came increased responsibilities and longer work hours, but on the positive side, my salary saw a significant boost, much to the delight of my wife who's 40 and our three kids who are 14, 14, and 10. The other day I was working from home, participating in an important Zoom meeting about an infrastructure expansion plan with around 30 people, including a government representative and the regional head of our firm. As an introverted person, public displays of affection have never been my cup of tea, so you can imagine my shock and embarrassment when my wife, who had just returned home, unexpectedly sat on my lap and started kissing me right in the middle of the call. My concentration was broken and I lost my train of thought, just as I was responding to a point made by the regional head. I'm pretty sure everyone on the call noticed too, given the awkward silence that followed. My wife eventually noticed my discomfort and the ongoing call, so she left the room. From that point on, it was challenging for me to regain composure and continue with the presentation. I found myself speaking too fast and even stuttering. A coworker, female 39, took over for me and I didn't contribute much until the Q&A session. 
Towards the end of the call, when I mentioned my plans to refine the plan by the next meeting, the regional boss made a comment about my wife needing me more than they did, which further added to my humiliation. After the call, I confronted my wife about what had happened. Surprisingly, she didn't seem too bothered and even thought it was good for my colleagues to see me as a family man. She mentioned that she thought the webcam was off. I was frustrated and explained to her that her actions had made us appear disgraceful and immature, causing me great humiliation. However, my wife seemed taken aback and accused me of caring too much about what others thought of us. She even suggested that I might be embarrassed of her, which led to a heated argument, and she eventually locked herself in our room. Since then, we haven't spoken much, and I'm sleeping on the couch, feeling too ashamed to discuss this with anyone in my personal life. Am I the jerk? Update. When I returned to the office, I had a chance to speak with my director about the situation. He and most of my coworkers found the incident quite amusing, likely because I'm known as the stoic, reserved guy in our workspace. Later, I had a lengthy conversation with my wife, starting with an apology for overreacting. I expressed sentiments that I don't usually share, but knew she appreciated. She accepted my apology and apologized as well, admitting that she was also embarrassed and genuinely thought my webcam was off. She mentioned that her spontaneous action might have been aimed at conveying that I'm a family man to my coworkers. However, she did admit to feeling slightly uncomfortable with the fact I work so closely with some of my female colleagues. Finally, she expressed a desire for me to be more physically affectionate, which she felt had diminished due to my longer work hours. Things have cooled down by now, but I still can't shake off a slight sense of embarrassment about the whole incident. Am I the jerk for leaving after my mom kept joking about my childhood and calling me her practice kid? My, 19 mil, parents had me young and on accident. My childhood was nothing but money problems and listening to my parents fight with each other. Things only got better when my mom left my dad and started seeing my stepdad. He brought financial stability and is more of a father to me than my biological dad ever was. They have a daughter together, my sister Melody. I'm not blind. I know they shower her with attention and buy her everything they can because I never had anything when I was her age. When I was younger, it frustrated me to see her loved in a way that I never was, but now I know that my mom did her best with the experience and resources she had. It's just bad luck that it worked out the way it did. With that context out of the way, Melody recently turned four and my parents went all out. They invited not only all of the family in the area, but also some of Melody's friends from daycare and their parents. Once my mom and the other moms had a few drinks each, they started gossiping. The conversation, which I was not part of but was listening to because I was bored watching the kids, turned to sharing stories about their kids. My mom, instead of sharing cute stories about Melanie, decided to tell a group of random moms about the time I tried to make my parents stop fighting by collecting change lying around the house and giving it to them. I was seven. She was laughing the whole time and ended the story with, Ah, the things you learn with the oldest. Practice, kids, am I right? My new husband and I never fight in front of Melody. I think that's why she's so much easier than OP. That story is a painful memory for me. I was so hurt that she thought it was so hilarious, but I didn't say anything and just tried to brush it off. The mom started talking about kindergarten because a few of them have kids who will be starting in the fall. My mom, who by then had had more than a few, decided that it would be a great idea to share the story of how she carried the school into letting me do gym class in my winter boots because that was the one pair of shoes I had. Again, she told the whole story with a grin on her face and laughing. The last thing she said almost made me blow up. Thank goodness Melody can have all the shoes she wants, though with how much crap OP pulled at that age, maybe it was best I didn't waste money on the practice kid. I texted my mom, I'm glad you find how poor and miserable we were so funny, but it really upsets me you clearly think of me as a practice for Mel. I'm going, so someone should watch the kids. I then left without talking to anyone. When I got home, I checked my text, and I found a rant from her, saying that they were her stories, and that she felt that she could share them however she wanted to. She called me sensitive for not taking a joke, and suggested I get a therapist. I already have one and she knows that, because I was jealous of a four-year-old. She said I was rude for leaving. I was too upset to respond then, but after some thought, I may be in the wrong. Am I the jerk? Update. So the first thing I did was talk to my stepdad. Contrary to some of your assumptions, I don't live at my parents' house, so I asked him over to breakfast to talk on a day my mom had work, but I had off. He knows I usually plan around my mom's work schedule, so I think he knew it was serious beforehand. We sat down over eggs and I told him what had happened. He had been doing something else at the time and was absolutely shocked. 
Apparently, my mom had told him a twisted version of events. According to him, she'd said that I had sent her an angry text because of a few harmless jabs and that she was only kidding and didn't mean any harm. She also had conspicuously left out her drunken text to me. His reaction to the actual content of her jokes can only be described as a deep sadness and frustration. He offered me true support and affirmation, something that I could never pitch my mom doing in a million years. My mom can be nice, but she's not great at anything deeper than platitudes. What did I ever do to deserve him? He was also completely blindsided by the fact that there was alcohol at the party. Apparently, he had left the planning to her and had no idea. I told him that I want to go very low contact with my mom for a bit and asked for his help to see him and Melody without having to deal with her. He said that he understood and agreed to have me over when she's not around. He told me he would get my mom help with her emotions and her drinking, and I told him that she probably wouldn't cooperate and promised to help him get her the help she needs in what ways I can. A half hour after my stepdad left, I texted my mom the following. Hey ma, I've mulled over what happened at Mel's party and I've come to the realization that our relationship is not healthy. You put me down for things that weren't my fault and laugh at how you and my biological dad messed up my childhood. It hurts to hear you speak about me like that and I don't think you understand exactly how much. I've also come to the understanding that you serving alcohol at the party without even telling dad isn't normal. This isn't a one-time thing and you've been doing it too much. You have two problems, and until you get some serious help with both of them, I would like very little contact with you. Please don't contact me again outside of an emergency. I then blocked her from texting me. I know this isn't as dramatic of an update as you were hoping for, but I hope that someone can take something from it. I know it's only been a few days, but I have no regrets. Maybe going cold turkey with her was what I needed. Am I the jerk for correcting my stepdaughter's dad when he called me her nanny? I've been with my wife for eight years now. She has primary custody of her daughter, Santana, who's nine. Santana sees her dad, Mark, every other weekend and some holidays. As I've been one of Santana's primary caregivers for the past seven years, since I moved in with her mom, I've taken care of her more than Mark has, and we are quite close. My wife and I went on to have two kids together, who are now five and 18 months old. I've been a stay-at-home dad since the five-year-old was born. As a result, I'm the one making lunches, driving kids to activities, etc., that includes for Santana. Mark has always felt insecure about my place in Santana's life. I've always encouraged her relationship with her dad, while also being a place she can go to in order to vent about both her parents. I've never asked her to call me dad, but I've made it clear I love her the same as her siblings, and she's also said she loves me and considers me her second dad. Mark also mocks me for my stay-at-home dad role. My wife always shuts him down, and I just ignore him. He has in the past jokingly called me Santana's nanny, and I just roll my eyes and say, whatever you think, Mark. I really don't see him much as my wife will take Santana to her dad's and pick her up. However, yesterday, my wife was sick and asked me to pick up Santana. She really couldn't get out of bed and I knew Mark wasn't going to drive out to us. He's refused in the past. So I went over to his place to pick her up. He was throwing a barbecue and had some family there. I had never met any of them. Santana ran into my arms, excited to see me and shouting my name. A few people looked at Mark curiously. He laughed and said, That's Santana's nanny. I shook my head and said, I'm her stepfather, Greg. Nice to meet you all. Mark turned red and barely said goodbye to Santana. I didn't think much of it outside Mark just being Mark. However, Mark texted my wife later saying I humiliated him and given I'd likely never see those people again, I shouldn't have said anything. My wife told him he's overreacting and then texted me, saying I had no right to correct him in his own home. My wife told him he's overreacting, and he then texted me, saying I had no right to correct him in his own home. He asked what was the big deal in his family thinking I'm her nanny. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but man, Mark must be feeling really insecure about himself, that's for sure. You're doing great, Greg. Santana is lucky to have you. My fiancé doesn't want to invite his sister-in-law to our wedding because she has feelings for him when it's more the other way around. My fiancé, Will, has a younger brother, Charlie, who's 34, and he's married to Evie, who's 33. Evie is a beautiful woman both inside and out. She's one of the nicest people I've ever met, and she's an amazing and supportive friend, maybe the best friend I've ever had. Will, Charlie, and Evie went to school together. Charlie and Evie have been together for 20 years. They married pretty much straight out of high school. During their time at school, Will and Evie went on to date before she started dating Charlie. 
Will had been hounding her for a date, and she eventually said yes to try and make Charlie jealous as she liked him but didn't think he felt the same way. Yes, completely aware this is ridiculous, but Evie was 13 at the time. Evie told me about this date pretty early on. She had wanted me to know in case I thought she had feelings for Will. She made it very clear that she's never had romantic feelings for Will and that she just used him to get that one date to make Charlie jealous. I do know that Will had feelings for Evie and from what he said, he stopped having them since we'd been together. Will and I are currently in the process of planning our wedding for next summer. We've been putting together a list of who we want to ask to be a part of the wedding party and who we want to invite to the wedding. I want to have Evie as one of my bridesmaids because I know she'll be supportive and reliable. Will frowned and told me that he wasn't planning on Evie being part of the wedding. I asked if he had a falling out with Charlie and wasn't inviting him either as they're a package deal as a married couple. Plus, there's no way one would attend without the other. He replied that he hadn't fallen out with his brother, but he couldn't see himself getting married with Evie there as according to him, she still has feelings for him and he wouldn't want it to ruin our day. I know for a fact that she doesn't. I asked him if she had confessed feelings or something. He said no, but it's the way she is with him. He gave examples like how she's always around our house. Evie and I run together three times a week. As I live closer to her work, she comes to ours to change instead of going home. How she'll make his favorite dessert when we celebrate Christmas at their place. His birthday is Christmas Eve. How she does little thoughtful things like dropping off baked goods for us or how she takes an interest in things he's interested in. The three of them support the same football team. To me, none of this is Evie showing she has romantic feelings for him, she's just being a good friend. I told him this, but he's insistent on not inviting Evie to the wedding. I know that if Evie isn't invited, Charlie won't attend and it will snowball further as the family are really close, but it will look like I'm the one causing this. I reached out to Evie after the conversation with Will and I asked her to be honest with me if she had any sort of romantic feelings for Will. At first, Evie laughed at the idea of her having any sort of feelings for Will. She then admitted that until I met Will, he had made her uncomfortable, but it had lessened since we got together two years ago. She explained that Will would make comments about how they were more suited than her and Charlie. He used to send her drunk messages about how they belonged together. She told me that Charlie knew about the messages and they had pulled themselves away from Will during that period, but only allowed him back in when I started dating him. I asked her if he had sent her anything like that since we've been together. Evie went quiet on the phone before saying that he had sent her a message on the weekend when Will, Charlie, and some of their friends had gone out drinking. She had canceled on running this week but hadn't given me a reason and it turns out she's avoiding Will. Charlie also hasn't been talking to his brother since the night out because of the message. She sent me that message and it was very, very bad. He told her that he wished he was the father of her baby. Evie's pregnant with their fourth and not Charlie and how he'd be a better dad than Charlie could ever be. I'm not sure what to do. I love Will and he's convinced that Evie has feelings for him when she's made it clear that she does not. I thought Will had moved on, but he's now sending Evie messages. Is there anything I can do or is this relationship just doomed? Edit. Not that it makes anything better. Will was 15 when they had the date. Evie is six months younger than her husband. She's 34 next month. I told Will that we need to talk when he comes back from taking his mom to an appointment this morning. It's nothing serious, just taking her to get new glasses. I think he knows I want to talk about Evie, as he asked if it was about Evie and the wedding. I said yes, and he sighed before telling me we would discuss it when he comes back. I'm going to put together a weekend bag so I can leave quickly if I need to. I've texted Evie and Charlie to tell them I'm going to talk to Will about his behavior because it needs to change and he needs to realize that nothing will ever happen with Evie. Charlie responded wishing me luck and has said that their house is open to me if I need it. He also apologized for me having to go through this as they shouldn't have stuck their heads in the sand about this hoping it would go away. I know I should have brought this up after she told me, but I'm very non-confrontational and will try to avoid an argument if I can. Update. Will and I had a talk when he came back. I told him that I knew about the text he had sent to Evie on the weekend. He denied it straight away, telling me that she was lying, but quickly changed his tune once I started reading him the text. He then started to apologize and claimed it was just a moment of weakness after Charlie had been showing the group pictures from their family holiday last month. One of them had made a comment about Evie being out of Charlie's league, which reminded Will that he had lost his chance with Evie all those years ago. He then sent her the text. I asked him how he would feel if it had been Charlie harassing his partner and he just lowered his head and said he would be upset but that Charlie didn't deserve Evie. 
I told him that Evie wasn't an object to be given to whomever is deemed worthy of her and that she chose Charlie and that should have been enough for him. The fact there is someone out there who loves Charlie for who he is and makes his brother happy should be enough. Will told me that he was jealous of Charlie as he has everything he wanted and it wasn't fair because he's the eldest. Charlie did better than Will in school. He was better at sports. Charlie is more successful as he was able to do what he wanted. Will feels he had to do what his parents expected while Charlie could go to uni for whatever he wanted. Seeing Evie with Charlie is a reminder that Charlie has everything he wants. I asked Will if Evie was single and interested in him, would he leave me? Will refused to answer the question, but it was all I needed to hear. I told Will that I was going to stay elsewhere for a couple days while I figured out where I'll go because we are over. I don't want to stay living with someone who doesn't care about me. When I went to go and get the bag I packed, Will asked me if he could have the ring back as it's a family heirloom. It belonged to his grandma and was intended for whomever got married first, but when Charlie asked for it, Will apparently threw a massive tantrum over it, saying that it should be his since he's the eldest. I told him no, it was going to the person who it was meant to go to, Evie. I'm now at Charlie and Evie's for a couple days while I figure out getting a new place to stay or if I will move closer to my family. I work for myself, so that makes things easier. Charlie and Evie have decided they will be going low contact with Will. They would go no contact, but it would cause drama with the family and neither want that, especially Evie. Will called Charlie asking if I was with them, but Charlie told Will that he had no idea where I was. Charlie then proceeded to tell Will that they're going low contact with him because of the way Will has been towards Evie and that he is now doing what he should have done years ago to protect Evie. Evie has apologized several times as she feels she's the reason my relationship has ended, but I have reassured her that the only person at fault here is Will and I don't blame her for anything. If anything, she's a victim in all of this too. I've given her the ring, but she has said that I should give it back to mother-in-law as she doesn't want it. I wish I had seen Will's behavior before it got this far, but I was blinded by love. Looking back, I can see there were red flags that I just decided to ignore. Old guy swipes my shopping cart with his Prius, expects to trade vehicle insurance. I was getting ready for a home project and had picked up some corrugated steel roofing, a load of lumber, and four bags of construction sand from the local big box home improvement store. The lumber was over 12 feet long. Everything fit on one cart. My pickup truck was parked in the parking lot and I planned to push the cart there to load it, just like hundreds of other customers do. There's a high awning in the store exit and after that there's the parking lot. There's no pedestrian painted crosswalk, but this is California. Parking lots are pedestrian right of way. Anyway, I check both ways before pushing this heavy, long, and unwieldy load into the parking lot. I let the Jeep coming from my right go by. The Prius on my left is a long way away, so off I go. I didn't realize how fast the Prius was going, almost 40 miles per hour. I had about 8 feet of lumber into the parking lot when he drove up on me. He swerved to miss, so he didn't hit me head on but he did kiss the load of 4x8s with his right front quarter panel. The wood then laid a perfect crease all the way down the side of his shiny Prius, all the way back to his rear quarter panel. With 200 pounds of sand, another 200 or 300 pounds of wood, and maybe 100 pounds of steel, the cart didn't move. Heck, the wood wasn't even damaged. The driver stopped almost 30 feet away, put his car in park, and came to check the damage. He was old. Look, I'll be 60 this year, but I guessed he was easily 20 years older, skinny and looked like dried jerky, but spry enough and alert. We asked if each other were okay. He checked the damage on his car and out of habit, I took photos of the damage, his license plate, my cart and the area. Then he came up and asked to trade vehicle insurance. I laughed in his face. My truck is parked way over there. Why would I give you the insurance for it? He got upset and asked me how I was going to pay for his car. I pointed out that he technically hit a pedestrian in a pedestrian area, was going too fast, and saw me enter his path from 50 feet away. He had plenty of time to halt and let me cross. He was upset, then hit on the bright idea that maybe the store was at fault and liable for parking lot accidents, and said he was going to talk to the manager. After he left, I decided I wanted to stick around and see what happened, but I needed my stuff loaded, so I left my cart parked out of the way, brought my truck under the awning, and started loading. The old guy and a manager came out, and once the manager understood what happened, she explained how the store was not liable. He talked about suing the store, and she shrugged and told him to go ahead. The company lawyers would take care of it. But since he said lawsuit, she couldn't talk anymore, and she left. He came back over to me and asked, how was I going to make this right? 
I told him nicely that since I had no damage, I didn't need anything from him running into me. He said I ran into him and that he was calling the cops. Okay, dude, you do that. I know something about the cops in this city. Unless there's something major, their response time can be measured in hours or never. So I went back and finished loading my truck, then I got in and sat in the AC to cool off. Finally, I wrote my name on a paper and my telephone number. I gave it to the guy and told him to give it to the cops when they arrived, and then I left. After about five hours, a cop called and asked to trade information about the guy, basically driver's license info. They were still at the store and the guy sounded frustrated. So I read off the details of my license and the cop read off the details of his license. No insurance info was traded. He just wanted to know who to sue. The cop emphasized the gentleman's birth date. That's when I learned he was 98 years old. Good on him for keeping his license. The cop emphasized this was a civil matter and the old guy could sue. I said I understand and look forward to it. And that's where we stand. I've still no court summons and no other action. My backyard goldfish pond is still in work. New neighbor demands I stop fishing because it's bad for the environment. I, 25 male, live in my family's cottage, which I was given ownership of. The cottage itself is a waterfront property facing a medium-sized lake. My family has been living here for generations as my great-grandfather originally bought it before passing it down, eventually leading to me. My neighbors are a different story as many of the people I have known since childhood have moved out. The houses that my neighbors once had have been torn down and replaced with designer-style homes. With the construction of these homes come new neighbors and an HOA of which I am not a member of. My problem started with my next-door neighbor, Sophie. She's in her 50s or 60s, over fishing. One day, after doing some canoe fishing, I was approached by Sophie on my beach. She started asking if it was legal to fish on the lake, to which I said it was, as long as you pay the $25 per year license. After that, I said that I had to go, as I had caught some fish, and I wanted to start processing them for dinner as it was getting late. After our conversation, I did not hear from her for over two weeks. My encounter with her this time was not in person, but through a letter. In this letter, she wrote about how dangerous fishing is to the environment and why I should stop. In response, I chose to simply chuck it in my recycling bin and ignore her as it wasn't worth my time. My most recent encounter with her was two days ago, while I had some friends over. It was in the afternoon when I had ran back into the house for some more beers along with one of my friends. While grabbing the drinks, we heard a knock at the door. When I answered the door, it was Sophie and she had another letter. Before handing the letter over, she said that she had tried to be diplomatic and now she has had enough and has a letter from the HOA. Admittedly, I was a bit tipsy at the time, and in response, I laughed and called her stupid for believing the HOA can do anything before closing the door on her. After sobering up, I felt conflicted. On one hand, I felt that I was justified in my actions because my fishing is none of her business. On the other hand, I feel that I could have dealt with her in a more tactful way. Am I the jerk? It's kind of ironic, as an individual fishing for their own food in a canoe is about as sustainable as it can get. Not the jerk. That is kind of blowing my mind. Oh, sorry Sophie, let me just jump in my car, drive to the store, and buy some fish that was shipped in from somewhere else instead. Is that better? Some states even have harassment laws protecting hunters and anglers from this type of behavior. You could potentially hold her for civil liability if the behavior continues. Not the jerk. She's boarding on harassment. Not only that, I'm sure she's lying as the HOA knows you're not a member, which would mean that they can't do anything. Not only that, an HOA can't control how often and where you fish. This woman is the reason a vast majority of Americans refuse to live in an area with an HOA. Am I the jerk for getting an entire table for myself after my husband and his mom didn't save me a seat? I'll start this off by saying that I, female 32, have been with my husband Bob, male 39, for three years, married for one. His mom has a habit of keeping me out of most of their functions with the excuse of, you work too much. Not true, because sometimes I do make myself available, but yet find myself excluded. Last week, his mom invited us for a celebratory dinner at the restaurant after she completed her recovery. I had something to do on that day, but I let her and everyone else know that I'd be there at 8 p.m., Bob obviously knew I was coming. Thing is, when I arrived to the restaurant, I saw that the table was full. 
All chairs had been taken and I just stood there with a complete puzzlement while Bob and his mom just stared at me. His mom then told me there was no place left for me and that I could either have Bob get up and take his seat or go home. I was so upset, but instead of going home, I just went and took an entire table for myself. Bob and his mom watched with their eyes popping out of their heads like they saw something shocking. Not gonna lie, I did get weird looks from the guests, but so did Bob and his mom. It was awkward in all honesty. I had my dinner, dessert, then went home. I saw Bob and his mom staring grudgingly while I was making my way out. He got home an hour later and was yelling at me, saying that I embarrassed his mom in front of her guests. I yelled, asking what was I supposed to do after I got denied a seat and he told me that it wasn't his nor his mom's fault, guests arrived before me and took all the available chairs. I told him he could have saved me a chair. He said that I could have just left instead and reminded me that I was a guest and that I shouldn't expect this level of entitlement to be accepted. He then went on about how I ruined the entire dinner for him and his mom with what I did and he's been pouting about it for days now. I don't get it. I really don't. Was my expectation really that entitled? I mean, as his wife, he should have saved me a seat. But clearly, I'm missing something here. Not the jerk. OP, is this level of disrespect really what you want for the next 20 years? Not the jerk. They clearly excluded you and didn't help you get accommodated. This isn't some stranger. This is your husband. Who had you eat dinner alone and then blamed you for what he did? Not the jerk. You are married to someone who values his relationship with his mother above you. He cares about how you made them look instead of how they made themselves look after denying you a seat. Here's what you do. 1. File for separation so you can start the divorce proceedings. 2. When he asks why you are going this route, tell him, I'm choosing to walk away because I deserve better than the crumbs you leave thrown to the floor behind you. While I love and value you, I am not loved or valued by you because that spot belongs to your mother. There have been too many instances in our relationship where you have proven your mother is your priority regarding common decency, respect, or love. Until you open your eyes and see your mother's manipulations for what they are, you will be alone. 3. Start therapy for yourself so you can begin to move on. You're only 32. You shouldn't have to waste your love on someone who doesn't want it. Give it to someone who will stand up, love, honor, treasure, and be faithful to you. There are men out there, unfortunately, the one you chose is not it. If you want to make things work with him, therapy and boundaries must be set in place. If he allows those boundaries to be crossed too many times, you know you did what you could and walk away with a clear conscience. Good luck to you. Karen wrote an angry embellished review about me because her son had an allergic reaction. This incident happened last week, but I just found out today that she wrote an exaggerated review about me, my manager's words. It was an eight-top table, and I had seen to them for their entire meal. At the end, I asked if they were celebrating a birthday, because I saw flowers, and they said yes, to which I offered our free birthday dessert. Anyone on the dessert menu, free of charge. That's how our restaurant operates. So they order a dessert along with two scoops of what we call hula pie ice cream, which is vanilla with fudge and macadamia nuts for the kids. I read it back to them and then ring it up. Several minutes later, I check in and the daughter says she doesn't like it, so I offer vanilla plain instead. This is where it got frustrating. The mom turns to me and says, Vanilla is what we had ordered in the first place. I tell her, actually, I was told hula, but I can grab vanilla now for her, no problem. The mom then asks if there's nuts in the hula ice cream because the son is allergic and he's having a reaction. I say, yes, there is. So the grandparents rush him out across the street to the pharmacy. The mom says it doesn't matter anymore and not to get the vanilla for her daughter. I go tell my manager the situation and when I come back, they're all leaving except one guy. I hand him the bill and, because I'm upset that they're making it out to be my fault, I tell the guy, in the future, please let your server know if there's an allergy, especially one this severe. That way we can avoid this and any cross-contamination. He says he understands and he heads out. Today, I learned that the mom wrote a review saying I knew about the nut allergy and that she definitely ordered vanilla. No, I read it back to her. I'm so frustrated, like I could have been fired if my managers didn't believe me. Take responsibility for your kid's health and make sure you let the restaurant establishment know if they have an allergy. Some review sites allow for responses. If so, your manager should make a reply and confirm that this is not the case at all. 
There should absolutely be a response from management if she mentioned you by name in the review. Am I the jerk for trying to get back into my kids' lives? I, 28 female, have three kids with my ex, 30 male. We were never married, but we dated while I was in college. My senior year, I got pregnant and had twins, both boys. He moved me in with him and we were raising our kids together. 14 months after giving birth to the boys, I had a girl. Immediately after I had postpartum depression, I wasn't doing well and I decided to go back home to my parents to try to clear my head. Once home, I saw my old bedroom, my old things, and was kind of reminded of what I always wanted to do. I always wanted to take a gap year to travel, but I had gotten a scholarship to my first choice school and it seemed silly to pass it up. I decided then, this is what I needed to get in the right mental state. I called BD and told him I'm going to Europe for a couple months. He was incensed and tried to talk me out of it. I explained this is what I needed to go back to being myself and to be a better parent and partner. So I went. He called me the first couple of months and kept asking if I was coming back. Eventually, he stopped calling. About six months in, my parents told me that he had filed to get full custody of the kids. I was mad he didn't tell me before doing it, but I thought I'd at least take full advantage and really see the world and get it out of my system. I traveled for a little over two years and visited every continent. When I was done, I really wanted to see my kids, but I felt guilty for not being present in their lives and I didn't want to face my ex. One of the friends I made in my travels offered me a gig as an English teacher in a private school in Thailand. I took the opportunity and spent the next three years doing that. This year, I returned stateside and I stayed with my parents. They showed me pictures of the kids and told me my ex let them see the kids a couple of times. I got in touch with him, telling him I was ready to be involved in their lives and he flat out refused. I threatened to sue for custody and he just replied, good luck with that and sent me pictures of me partying in Europe. They are not flattering. My parents want to see their grandkids more, but they tell me it's all my fault for not being able to see them. Am I the jerk for trying to see them? Top comment. Reddit, it's my time to shine. Had to make a brand new account to not reveal anything personal. I know exactly who this person is. I know the kids and the dad. Those kids were raised by a wolf pack. When she left them, basically anyone and everyone who had a passing relation to the dad stepped up. His mom moved in for the first year to help with the babies. Neighbors, friends, and relatives all donated or bought kids stuff for them. Clothes, diapers, toys, anything he needed. One of his friends manages a restaurant and he brought them unused food almost every night. I work at the bank, so I had nothing useful to contribute other than money and time. One of our buddies runs an MMA gym and he has a kids class that starts after school. So he takes them in after school until their dad gets off work. Whenever the kids need a babysitter, Two or three rowdy men show up ready to be horsies or punching bags for the boys and tea party guests for the girl. One of our other friends is a lawyer. He helped him gain full custody and advised him through the process. OP's parents are rich and they always offer money to help. On the advice of our lawyer friend, he always refuses. That way, they can't use that in any future custody battle. He didn't even let them introduce themselves as their grandparents so they can't claim a relationship. Their dad is doing well now. Those kids don't want for anything. Every Sunday night, he hosts us to watch football or hang out with the kids. His daughter delights in serving everyone wheat juice. They're so much better off without this jerk. I can understand needing a break, but a couple months in Europe is already pretty excessive when you're leaving three kids. But to then hear at six months that her ex is going for custody and her response is to YOLO it for a five or six year adventure? There cannot be any possible way she rationally expected to be back in the kids' lives, especially if she contests it now and has it on record that she was spending much of it partying in an unflattering way. If the second OP is legit, at least the kids don't seem to have missed out on much. Am I the jerk for telling my stepdaughter her friend's mum is the reason her dad and I are divorcing? My husband, Jack, has been spending a lot of time with our neighbor, Sophie. It's worth noting that Jack and Sophie had an affair when she was 19, he was with his ex and she was with an ex-boyfriend at the time. Sophie is a widow as her husband passed in 2021. Jack and I also married in 2021. Jack and Sophie remained friendly after their affair, partly because their daughters were and still are friends. They've been best friends since primary school. Jack and I have been having some issues in our marriage and we've been going to counseling for the past six months. I brought up in counseling that his friendship with Sophie makes me uncomfortable because he has previously had an affair with her. Jack argued that she's just a friend and that neither of them have those feelings anymore, 
nor is Sophie interested in having a romantic relationship because no one compares to her late husband. That's apparently something she has said to him after he suggested setting her up on a date with a younger coworker who had expressed an interest in her. There's a lot of crossover between her job and his, which is part of the reason they remain close. In our last session, Jack admitted that he had been going to Sophie for her advice. He's been going to her to get advice about our relationship, as well as an issue with his daughter. The issue with his daughter, I understand, because it's something that Sophie has experience with, and she had a unique perspective that really did help him. The fact that they've been discussing our relationship, I don't feel comfortable with that. Jack has been really dismissive about it, arguing that it's the same as me going to my sister for advice. It's not the same. He had an affair with this woman. I recently saw Sophie in the local coffee shop and she was friendly with me, asking how I was doing and if my stepdaughter was doing better. I asked her if something was going on between her and Jack. She denied that anything was going on between her and Jack. I asked her to stop giving Jack advice because it's damaging our relationship. Sophie said that she wasn't going to stop giving her friend advice and that it wasn't her fault that I was insecure in my relationship, but that she doesn't see Jack as anything more than a friend, despite what I think. Sophie reiterated several times that she was just friends with Jack, and that she isn't that troubled teenager who had an affair with a married man anymore, and that she didn't want to implode her life again. When I got home, I told Jack that I didn't want him to see Sophie anymore. Jack argued with me, saying he wasn't going to stop seeing Sophie when nothing is going on between them. He offered to show me his texts with her, but I told him that I didn't trust him not to delete any text that he knew would upset me. Jack got frustrated and told me I was being ridiculous by accusing him of being deceitful. When his daughter came home, she was upset because Sophie had texted her daughter after our conversation and told her to come straight home as she didn't want her daughter to get pulled into what is going on between Jack and I like she had been. His daughter was angry and accused me of ruining her friendship before storming up to her bedroom, so Jack is also angry with me about it. I'm just not sure what else to do. Is there anything I can do? The fact he's constantly going to a woman he had an affair with for advice is just making me feel uncomfortable and nothing he does feels reassuring. Update. We were meant to go to a counseling session this morning. However, Jack has canceled the session and any further sessions. Jack does not want to continue counseling as he has filed for divorce. He said it was something he had been considering for a while. Apparently, when he had gone to talk to Sophie the first time, it was to get her recommendation for a divorce lawyer but she had tried to convince him that we just needed to work on our issues. Jack said that he had told her that he had lost trust in me and nothing we did was fixing it. The way I've been acting over him and Sophie also cemented that to him. She gave him the name of a friend who is a divorce lawyer, but told him that he was making a mistake. It turns out that when Sophie's daughter didn't come to our house as planned after school, it was because Jack had told Sophie he had planned to tell me about the divorce that evening. He backed out on telling me after his daughter came home upset not wanting to rock the boat with her. My conversation with Sophie was just the excuse she used. If I'm honest, I still don't trust that nothing has been going on between them. The whole thing between them is weird, but my marriage is over, so what they do isn't my problem. I'm not going to fight to be with someone who lies to my face and states that they don't trust me. Update. Jack and I are getting divorced after two years of marriage. Jack has two kids, but this concerns his daughter, Ella, who's 15. The day Jack told me he wanted a divorce, we told the kids after school. Ella was upset when she found out we're getting divorced and she went to her room. She came down after tea when it was just me and her in the house. Jack and his son had gone out. She asked me why her dad and I were getting divorced and wanted to know if it was because of her. I told Ella that she and her brother are not the reason for the divorce, but that her best friend's mom, Sophie, who's 34, is. Sophie and Jack had an affair when she was 19. When the affair was exposed, Sophie's life basically imploded while Jack's pretty much remained the same. Just to state, I told Ella that Jack's continued friendship with Sophie and the running to her for advice is why we're getting divorced. Ella asked if Jack was having an affair again with Sophie. I told her that Jack was denying having an affair with Sophie again, but I suspected it. She asked what I meant by again, so I told her that Sophie and Jack had an affair when Jack was married to her mom. Ella has not been speaking to Jack since our conversation. She has also lashed out at her friend, even calling her mom names and saying that she's the reason our family is falling apart. They got into a physical fight, which resulted in both Jack and Sophie getting called into school to talk about it. In the meeting, Ella told them everything I had told her the night before and blamed Sophie for ruining her family again. Jack told her that Sophie isn't the reason. 
Jack told Ella the reason for the divorce is because he no longer trusts me because of a mistake I had made which sent us to therapy. Months of therapy weren't able to repair his trust in me. After Jack and Ella came home, she's now not talking to me either. Jack is furious that I said anything to Ella and that I ruined Ella's friendship with her friend. Jack snapped that it was not my place to say anything to Ella. He was angry that I was still stuck on his friendship with Sophie and continues to maintain nothing is going on. He told me that Sophie's friend said in the meeting that she now wants to move to a new school where no one knows her mom is certain names that she was called and that it was my fault. Am I the jerk? Ella asked me for a reason and I told her. I do believe Sophie is the true reason as the relationship between them is weird. Update. This blew up way more than I thought it would. Both Ella and her brother were aware of the kiss. They were there when Jack was told. I referred to it as a mistake as that's what Jack refers to it as. He said that he didn't consider the kiss to be cheating because I was drunk. I've moved out of the house since I made this post and I'm now staying with my sister until I find a place of my own. On the weekend, Ella reached out to her friend and apologized for lashing out at her at school. They look like they've made up as Ella is staying over at her house this weekend. Before she left, I apologized to Ella and told her that I shouldn't have dragged her into this. Ella told me that she would never forgive me, especially for damaging her friendship, and is glad that her dad is divorcing me. I offered to pay for the girls to do something together, but Ella refused, saying she didn't want to take my dirty money. I also apologized to Jack, who told me it was Sophie who needed the apology, not him, as it was her life I had tried to ruin without a shred of evidence. I tried telling him that I just didn't believe that he and Sophie weren't having an affair, and he snapped, telling me there's nothing going on with Sophie, and she had actually started seeing someone. He found out about this because she went to him for advice as he's the only person she knows who has also lost a spouse and dated again. He then told me that he wanted me to move out as Ella had told him that she wasn't going to return home while I was still there. So yeah, I've destroyed my relationship with Jack and his kids because I was insecure. It's my own doing. I'm the jerk. OP really left out that bit about her kissing another man as long as possible. Wow. Only people I feel bad for are the kids. OP obviously is terrible, but I got so many icks from Jack's whole relationship, both former and current, with Sophie. She was 19 when they had the affair. Am I the jerk for overstepping and embarrassing my boyfriend's cousin at her birthday party? I, 21 female, have been dating my boyfriend, Ben, who's 22, for three years now. Ben and his cousin, Rachel, who's 20, are extremely close. Their moms are sisters and both single moms, so they were practically raised together. Ben usually treats her like his little sister and is very protective of her, but they're also just best friends and do everything together. I've known Rachel for years as we went to high school together, but we were never in the same circle of friends until I started dating Ben, which is when my best friend, Jess, and I became part of their tight-knit group. Jess and Rachel didn't really get along in high school, but have since been able to become pretty good friends. Rachel and I aren't particularly close. I like her a lot and wish we were as close as she and Jess currently are, but she doesn't seem to like me very much. I know that because she's told me off several times. One time on vacation, she told me off after Ben and I had a little argument over where to eat dinner. Rachel told me I was being whiny and annoying. She's done this in front of their moms and constantly makes little remarks when we're with friends. Ben doesn't see much wrong with it because to him, she's treating me the way she would treat a sister and he finds it endearing that she teases me the same way she does to him, which is what I try to believe as well. Last week, Ben threw Rachel a surprise birthday party. I helped him plan and we both split the cost for anything we had to buy for it. I knew from Jess that Rachel had been talking to this guy who she really liked, so I thought it would be nice if I invited him as well as our friends. Fast forward, Rachel was surprised and the party was going great. We were getting along pretty well which made me happy. We were all drunk when the guy Rachel liked arrived with a friend. I greeted them at the door and walked with them over to Rachel in an attempt to kind of wingman for her. Rachel was talking to Jess, facing away from us, and as we got closer, we realized she's drunkenly telling Jess how much she likes the guy I invited and the friend he brought and doesn't know what to do, and then began comparing her hookups with both of them in great detail. Jess tried to get her to stop talking several times, but she was too drunk to realize, and I was frozen awkwardly as these two guys heard the entire thing. When Rachel finally turned around, she looked mortified. She went over to Ben and began telling him what had just happened. Rachel then asked him why he would even invite them, and he told her I must have invited them, since he didn't. Before I could even get any words out, 
Rachel began going off on me, saying I embarrassed her and put her in an uncomfortable situation and that now she wouldn't be able to enjoy her party amongst other things. I felt so bad that I couldn't get any words out and basically just let Rachel go off on me until Jess pulled me away. Jess told me she agreed that I embarrassed Rachel and it was crappy of me to not try and stop her. I explained myself, but she said it wasn't my place to invite them to begin with since I wasn't in the loop about Rachel's love life and it would be best if I kicked them out and left as well, so I did. It's been a week since the party and Rachel hasn't spoken to me. Jess thinks I should apologize to Rachel for embarrassing her at the party. I feel bad about the whole situation, but I can't help but feel like it's unfair as I was only trying to bond with Rachel and I didn't intentionally embarrass her. I feel like I'm owed an apology as well since I basically helped plan and pay for the party and got kicked out before even being given an opportunity to be heard. Update I read through some of the comments and realized just how much there was to the situation that I didn't think about. The following took place last night. 1. I reached out to Rachel and spoke with her. I sent her a long text explaining my side of the situation and tried to clarify what had happened. I didn't apologize and I expressed my feelings regarding our relationship as well as the incident at the party. She was not very receptive and was not open to accepting responsibility over her own behavior. She said that I crossed a line and even said she believes I embarrassed her intentionally. She thinks I invited them knowing about her situation. Apparently Jess was aware of that detail and invited them both in an attempt to humiliate her as payback for all the incidents we've had in the past, basically her mistreating me. 2. I spoke to Jess as well. I reached out to her and expressed how I felt regarding her kicking me out of the party that I was essentially co-hosting, as well as how I felt towards her basically throwing me under the bus and enabling the situation between Rachel and I to get worse. She was also not receptive. I was surprised by that since we've been best friends for years and never had any issues within our friendship. It was clear she was completely on Rachel's side, and not only that, but also apparently shares Rachel's dislike of me. I spoke to Ben about everything. I told him about this post. We read through some of the comments, and we talked about the entire situation. He said he wanted to be aware of everything that was going on, so he was with me while I texted Rachel and listened to my conversation with Jess on the phone. He apologized to me for not intervening sooner, for not leaving the party with me, and also for not realizing that Rachel's behavior towards me was beyond sisterly teasing. He took full responsibility for not hearing me and not validating my concerns whenever I addressed them. He reassured me that he'll be speaking to Rachel about her behavior and setting firm boundaries, and promised to do whatever he can to make sure I feel comfortable and safe within our relationship, which was such a huge relief after everything that happened. There's something else that he shared with me yesterday too, which was honestly the one thing I was not expecting. Apparently a few days ago, Ben, Rachel, and Jess were hanging out at Rachel's. He said Rachel didn't want to invite me and neither did Jess and that he found it odd that they were verbalizing that to him. What he found the most odd though was Jess' behavior towards him. He said he felt uncomfortable and in the moment didn't want to assume she was flirting with him but ended up leaving and after witnessing our conversation felt he should share this with me as he's starting to think there's potentially more to it. Moving on to today, literally a few hours ago, Ben came to see me and told me Rachel stopped by his place. He spoke with her and addressed everything he said he would. Her response to him was pretty much the same as her response to me. Shockingly enough though, she also told him she thinks he shouldn't even be dating me to begin with, told him she's no longer going to pretend to support our relationship and that he'd make a much better match with Jess. She ended up confessing to him that Jess has developed some feelings for him which is what brought them closer and she's talked with Jess about how much better suited they'd be than Ben and I. He shut it down immediately and came straight over to tell me about it. We've decided that we're going to distance ourselves from the friend group and cut ties with Jess. He's already blocked her on everything, I didn't even ask him to, and left the group chat we all had together. I'm heartbroken to learn that my best friend would do something like this, but kind of starting to think she was never my best friend after all, though it still hurts to lose the only best friend I've ever had. I haven't spoken to her about this yet, and to be honest, I don't think I'm going to. I don't want to waste any more energy with such awful people. Ben's been extremely apologetic and feels bad about the role he inadvertently played in all of this, as well as the way Rachel has been treating me, which to me is a good sign and has been very relieving. He's an amazing guy and I'm so happy to see that I was right in thinking that all the time. He also respects my decision to cut ties with Rachel and has agreed to discuss further what kind of boundaries we will be putting in place going forward in terms of the family dynamic. He even spoke with his mom about all of this after our talk to make sure she's in the loop regarding our boundaries as well as Rachel's behavior. She was very understanding about it 
and they both even insisted on paying me back what I spent on the party, but I don't want to accept because their support is more than enough. Am I the jerk because I told my sister's boyfriend he isn't a member of our family? I'm 21, male. My sister, who's 17, has this boyfriend who is always around. He acts like he lives here. They've been dating for two years, so he's gotten really comfortable with our family and our house. My little brother, who's 14, is sick right now, and it's been really stressful. When I'm not at school, I'm either at the hospital with my 14-year-old brother or at home watching my 8-year-old brother. It's been a lot. This morning, I was in the kitchen making food to bring to my parents at the hospital, when who should walk in? My sister's boyfriend. He asks me if I wanted help cooking, and I said no. He doesn't even know how to cook. He then proceeds to just stand there in the kitchen, getting in my way. I asked what he was doing, and he said he was waiting for me to be done. I asked why, and he said he was going to make something. I told him that maybe he should go to his house and use his kitchen then. He said he wasn't trying to bother me. I said that he is bothering me, and I'm sick of him always being here invading our space. I can't even relax in my own home the rare moments I get to myself, because he's always here. He said I wasn't being fair and that he's scared for my brother too and I shouldn't take it out on him. I told him to shut up, that he has no idea what he's talking about and to go home. Then he said it's important to stick together when there's a tragedy. I said yeah, families stick together, but he isn't a member of our family so let us have a day or two a week to ourselves and leave us alone once in a while. Then he left. My sister was angry when she came down 20 minutes later. She said I'm a mean bitter jerk. She said I had no right to say that to her boyfriend and he's her guest so he can come over whenever he wants. I didn't want to fight with her so I just said fine. Was I really being a jerk though? Why is this guy always here? Update. I did end up talking to my dad. He came home and spoke to my sister's boyfriend. He told the boyfriend he needs to not come over before 11 in the morning or be here after 7 at night. He also told the boyfriend he can't use our kitchen or let himself into the house. He needs to knock and be let in. And when he's hungry, he needs to go home to get food. My dad also put my brother's games in his room and told the boyfriend not to go into anyone's bedroom he hasn't been invited into. My sister was pretty upset about all of this, especially the rule saying he has to leave by 7 p.m. My dad asked her if he's been sleeping over and she swore up and down he wasn't. I don't think that's true, but it doesn't matter. My sister's boyfriend was pretty embarrassed and apologized to my dad, saying he didn't realize he was being a nuisance. My dad said it was fine and gave him a hug. I told him I was sorry I snapped at him and we hugged it out too. So I think everyone's good and even though my sister is upset with me and my dad, my dad said she will be better off in the long run because if she wants to see her boyfriend outside those hours, she'll have to leave her room. You're the jerk. He was just chatting casually with you. I understand you're stressed but he's also your sister's support person and it's nice to see him trying to be there for you too. You kind of overreacted but I guess it is understandable. But you're the jerk nevertheless. Not the jerk. Just because every day is totally excessive. If he was there often, I would understand. But absolutely every day shows that he's absolutely oblivious of your boundaries. I can't imagine coming back from the hospital after visiting your sick brother and never having the space to cry or let it out. Every day is just too much. Not the jerk. It's okay that he's comfortable, but he's crossing the line when he doesn't give you the space you need around the kitchen and such. Now, one thing to consider, since your sister is 17, I assume he's 17 as well. He's very immature still. Am I the jerk for making my husband a vegan dinner, even though he's completely against becoming one? I, 24 male, and my husband, 25 male, have been happily married for a little over a year now. We met through a mutual friend, and he learned very quickly that I'm vegan. About a year after we met and got closer, we started dating. He had no issues with me being vegan, but made it very clear that I couldn't force him into becoming one as well, which I respected. I haven't ever put him down for eating meat in front of me, as that's his choice. To each their own. We even served both vegan and meat-inclusive food at our wedding to accommodate both of our families. Up until now, everything was great. However, recently, I've been seeing a ton of vegan recipes on my Pinterest and decided I wanted to try making one for dinner. We don't usually end up getting to have fancy dinners at home as both of us work full time, but I found some time today to cook something up. It was a recipe for pulled pork sandwiches, but the pork wasn't actually pork. Instead, it was jackfruit. He seemed a little stressed about work, but I showed him the surprise dinner and that seemed to help his mood out. He ate it happily and even complimented my cooking. But when he asked me what was in it, and when I told him it was pulled pork sandwich with jackfruit as a meat alternative, he lashed out. 
He shouted, telling me that he made it clear he was staying a meat eater. I tried explaining that I wasn't trying to turn him into a vegan, but he had just walked away then. This happened a few hours back, and now he's refusing to talk to me. I feel like I might be the jerk for making him a vegan meal, even though he had made it extremely clear he wouldn't become one, because even if it wasn't my intention to make him one, I still made a vegan dinner that passed off as one with meat in it. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, this is a pretty commonly asked question, so I'll just clear it up. I didn't say it was pulled pork sandwich. All I had said was that I made some sandwiches for us. Nothing more and nothing less. I don't understand people like this who love food until finding out that it's vegan. You're not pushing veganism on him. You made a meal that you could eat and that he ended up enjoying. I don't see the issue. I don't eat dairy, so I use plant-based milks, butters, cheeses, etc. My husband doesn't care as long as it tastes good. I also make vegetarian and vegan meals at least once a week just to take a break from meat. As a big meat eater, he also doesn't care about that as long as it tastes good. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. Eating a single vegan meal does not make you vegan. That's like saying that I'm a fitness enthusiast because I went to the gym once last year. Entitled coworker tried to hijack our wedding. Hey Reddit, was listening to a Bridezilla story and it reminded me of something that happened when my wife and I were planning our wedding in 1992. My wife is the anti-Karen, the anti-Bridezilla. Backstory. On our first date, she fanned out a stack of restaurant coupons and said, where do you want to take me? We picked Pizza Hut. Her engagement ring is a heart-shaped amethyst with two little diamond chips. I bought it at Kmart. She cherishes it. Her wedding dress did not come from a bridal shop. It came from the Sears catalog. It's a very simple white and cream dress. It would not be out of place at an afternoon tea party. I bought my three-piece navy pinstripe suit since I needed a suit anyway. We wore the same clothes with different accessories to a costume party as a 1920s gangster and his wife. We had the wedding at our church. Our pastor was the real deal. He blessed the rings, and when he handed them back to me, they were ice cold. We exchanged the old wedding vows. A couple of my buddies found out at the last minute that they could make it, and they showed up. After we said our vows, they pulled out swords and made an impromptu arch for us to walk under. My wife's friends were upset and started yelling, Nobody told us to bring our swords. Yeah, major fantasy geeks on both sides of the aisle. 32 years together, 31 years married this October. Next anniversary, I'm going to take a page from my granddad and raise a toast to five years of wedded bliss. When my wife announced our engagement, one of her coworkers, not even a friend, apparently got wedding rabies. She was so happy and went over the top offering to help. My wife was doing the tiny amount of wedding planning that was needed as her maid of honor lived in New Jersey. We're in upstate New York and had two kids to look after. Coworker insisted that it wasn't fair to my wife that maid of honor wasn't doing the wedding planning. She kept trying to insert herself as the wedding planner. Nice of her to offer, but she wanted to arrange our wedding the way she wanted it. No, we did not want any of the nonsense she kept suggesting. Coworker, not knowing my wife well, of course had zero clue what our tastes were. My wife's maid of honor was already making custom silk flowers for us and the table as a wedding present. I think Coworker was delusional enough to think that she could weasel her way into being maid of honor. My wife kept politely but firmly shutting her down. Last straw was when coworker called me to tell me about the surprise bridal shower she was throwing for my wife so I could get her there. Oh no. First, my wife was already going to have a bridal shower at our house. Father-in-law and I went down to the fire hall and watched baseball. Second, my wife hates surprise parties. Third, my wife would never have picked that restaurant. An overpriced steakhouse is the absolute last restaurant we would ever pick. Fourth, who the heck was coworker planning on inviting? She didn't know any of my wife's friends. Wife shut that down hard. She immediately called coworker and told her off. No meltdown, no yelling, no screaming, no language or insults. Just pure anger, as hot and bright as a welder's torch. Cue tears from coworker. Boo hoo, I was just trying to help. Nope, denied. We joke that you need to keep my wife away from breakable objects when she's angry. Cities, mountain ranges, that kind of fragile stuff. Drama over and the wedding happened. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.